Welcome everybody to tonight's city council meeting of Tuesday, October the 3rd. And as we traditionally start off our meetings, we like to begin by opening with the singing of O Canada. And tonight, to sing O Canada, we have Sandy Bird. And I'd like to introduce Sandy Bird. Sandy joins us again as a member of our Accessibility Committee. Sandy has tirelessly been involved in bettering our community. She currently represents Niagara Falls through her work with the ODA, the Ontarians with Disabilities Act. Sandy loves... AODA, okay, well then I'm gonna get that corrected, Sandy. Thank you for that, I stand corrected. Sandy loves to sing and has been active in choirs for years, including at her own church, Holy Trinity in Chippewa. Thank you, Sandy, for sharing the national anthem with us again today. I'd invite everyone to please stand and we'll have Sandy tickle our ears by singing O Canada. Oh Canada, our home and native land, true patriot love, hear all thy sons command. With glowing hearts we see the rise, the true north, strong and free. From far and wide, O oh Canada, we stand on guard for thee. God keep our land, glorious and free. O oh Canada, we stand on guard for thee. O oh Canada, we stand on guard for thee. Sandy, well done. On behalf of the city, as usual, we say thank you. We're grateful. And Sandy, just for everyone knows, she came an hour early to make sure she was ready for tonight. So thank you, Sandy. Thank you, Sandy. Now moving along. In our agenda, we'd like to next do our land acknowledgement and our traditional Indigenous meeting opening. And I'd like to invite Chief R. Stacy Laform, Chief of the Mississaugas of the Credit, to share his testimony as we acknowledge and thank the Indigenous peoples who were stewards of this land for a millennia before us. Ani, Gima, Chief R. Stacy Laform, Mississaugas of the Credit. I'd like to acknowledge the Creator, the world around us, and our place within it. I acknowledge the many nations that walked this land in the past, the many nations that walk it today, and welcome you to the treaty lands of the Mississaugas of the Anishinaabe. Bay. The treaties with the Mississaugas are the Niagara Treaty of 1781 and the Between the Lakes Treaty of 1792. I would also like to acknowledge the Treaty of 1764 that recognized the Royal Proclamation of 1763, which set a new relationship between the Indigenous people and the Crown. Kimiwich Mumpi. Okay, so apologize, we had a little bit of a technical glitch. We'll get that looked into. But thank you, Chief Laform. We're grateful together for the land that we share. Well, next on item two in the adoption of the minutes, we're looking for a motion uh, motion by Councillor Peter Angel, seconded by Councillor Neustag, that we approve the minutes of the October 3rd Council meeting. If there's no discussion, all those in favor? Okay, and that's approved. Thank you for that. Now looking for disclosures of a pecuniary interest. Do we have any disclosures of Council? Councillor Peter Angelo. Thanks, Your Worship. PBD 2023-62, my parents own property that's within the notification zone. Okay, thank you for that, Councillor Peter Angelo. Councillor Peter Angelo will uh, submit his conflict in writing to the clerk as he just did. If there's no further uh, d conflict uh, or pecuniary interest disclosures, then I'll just move on to everyone's favorite part of the meeting, the mayor's report and announcements. It's not too long today. Start off with, we'll start off with our uh, obituaries. Um, Frank Galella, retired city employee from our water department. Sympathies to, to his family. 
Benita Elaine Mulligan, the mother of Caitlin Halligen from our fire department, and Gabe Marinelli, former <coughs> owner of Four Brothers, local cooking show, and a lifelong volunteer with the Lions Club and with Club Italia, who passed on. So our condolences to this and our sympathy to the families. Also today, we'd like to acknowledge a very special birthday, City Councilor Victor Peter Angelo's birthday today. So happy birthday, happy birthday, Vic. Next up, City High, always a bit of laugh when you're dealing with someone's birthday. The city highlighted, was recently highlighted on the international stage for education. If we can draw your attention to the screens. Okay, all right, we're having a little bit of technical glitches here tonight. Just just, <laughs> I'd rather not. Okay, well just give us one half a second. Is, <laughs> no, no, no problem. Is it, are we having some uh, technical glitches? That uh, it? Here, just decided, uh, to act up. Well, you guys let me know if uh, I move on without you, if you think you're going to be right behind me. Sorry, folks. Appreciate your patience. While we're waiting, Councilor Strange is going to do a couple card tricks for everybody. <laughs> yeah, why don't we do that? That's great. Uh, Councilor, why don't you do that? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, just this past weekend, we had the Niagara Falls, uh, well, it's not International Marathon anymore, but Niagara Falls Marathon. And um, just a special... Little girl, 11 years old, broke the world record for the five kilometer run. Wow. She's, just, she's from Stouffville, Ontario. And um, I would, the world record, which is just in incredible, beat it by two seconds. And the second place, who's a buddy of mine, um, was about a, just over a minute after her. And he's like 48, 49, so <laughs> this 11 year old just crushed everyone. Um, but I like to, you know, it's such a, a great honor and, and what an ability to, to run this, 5K in 17 minutes and 28 seconds over three miles, which is truly incredible. So I'd like to honor her, and I'd like maybe to refer it to uh, Kathy Moldenauer and the Recreation Committee, and, and we'd love to honor this, this young girl and bring her here and, and maybe do something, um, a plaque or something that we can honor, because it's probably gonna be a record that sticks for a while and done right at our marathon, so it's just amazing. Fantastic, that's great. So that happened right here in our community, so you're just and, gonna- And Kathy's from that town too, so. Oh, are you? Yeah, go ahead. I was born and raised in Stovall, Ontario, so it's nice to see uh, a young athlete from the community. Fantastic. All right. So we can just refer that to you, and you'll come back uh, to us. Okay, thank you for that. How are we make an out uh, with our IT people? You can't just uh, reboot it, or you got to... I could. Yeah, um, but not enough time at this point for that, right? Take, uh, are you giving the tech time to play? <laughs> Did you push the red button? Okay. Well, you know what? Well, you guys are uh, doing that. I'm going to jump to the second part of the one. You're just reboot it real quick. I'm going to jump to the second part here. Um, the Ontario Ministry of Transportation Annual Road Safety Awards took place, and we do have some recipients here that we'd like to acknowledge. Here from Niagara Falls, we'd like to congratulate Julie Ellis, who's a school crossing guard supervisor here in the city of Niagara Falls. So, Julie. We'd like to congratulate, uh, congratulate you and thank you. You're awarded for your leadership, your dedication, and creativity in safety promotion. She's a former chair of Ontario Traffic Council's School Crossing Program Committee for the last five years. And we appreciate all the hard work that she does. Julie created a pedestrian safety education program called Between the Lines. Safe and active travel for school featuring blue. Blue is the, the um, mascot, the butterfly. So Julie designed this free program for students in JK to grade three. And they educate us on active travel, uh, road safety, and the role of crossing guards in our community. The pro program was so successful, it was expanded to Fort Erie and to other age groups, and now they do more than a dozen presentations every year. We're quite proud of our um, crossing guards and specifically to Julie Ellis. So on behalf of the city, congratulations, Julie, on your, on your accomplishment and on your award. And I'm kinda... All right, we're there. Okay, so the city recently 
was highlighted on the international stage for education. So I was joined by our CAO, Jason Burgess, and Serge Felicetti, our Director of Business Development, where we were guests of the global university system, that's the University of Niagara Falls, Canada, as we traveled to Thailand and Singapore for the Education Innovation Summit. The University of Niagara Falls, Canada was highlighted, and there were international agents for universities from around the globe. We visited the London School of Business and Finance in Singapore, as well as university campus integration into the downtown. And we got to see firsthand how a university helps to integrate into the downtown. And of course, the Gus University or the University of Niagara Falls, Canada will be right next door to the City Hall in the Hatch Building in the beginning until it expands. And then we're gonna have several thousand students studying and living their lives here in our downtown, which would be a great opportunity to revitalize our downtown. The University of Niagara Falls, Canada welcomes their first cohort this coming January of 2024, where we're gonna integrate emerging technology and digital innovation. This will be leading edge offerings like biomedical sciences, the digital economy and marketing, and data analytics and entrepreneurship. We're very excited. This will be brand new education component here to the region. This is gonna add value. It's not gonna dilute or cannibalize any other programs offered here at Niagara. It's gonna be a niche uh, opportunity where they're gonna be teaching students for jobs that haven't even been created yet. So we're very excited. <clears throat> we're well received and very, we very much look forward to the opening of our new university in the downtown. The city just recently hosted the Grand Slam of Curling in Niagara Falls. This was a week of events with national television coverage as Sportsnet was covering the entire event. We were, I was joined, I know, by Councillors Peter Angelo, Baldinelli, Lococo, and Patel. If I left anybody out, uh, please let me know. I'd like to thank the staff and the team at the Gale Center. I can tell you we were so well received. They loved it so much. They're hoping they can come back. Apparently it was the, the highest profile event, the most fun and the best well attended since they've been doing this event and it offered a big boom, uh, big boon to the local curling club here in Niagara Falls. So congratulations to everybody that was involved for this once ever in Niagara Falls. We just had an OLG check presentation recently at Fireman's Park and I was joined by Councillors Patel, Newestag, Lococo Strange and Baldinelli and of course We've got a unique partnership with OLG where we have a hosting agreement, the city benefits from millions of dollars that go toward infrastructure projects in the city. And we were there to celebrate it that day. One of the infrastructure projects that was done is the Memorial Garden, the Children's Memorial Garden at Fireman's Park. So we were there to commemorate and to celebrate the good things that come from the money that we receive from hosting the casinos. We had the Enbridge Tree Canada Earth Day tree planting event that took place. I was joined by Councillor Strange as we planted uh, hundreds of trees in one of our local parks. And, uh, and of course, our committee was showing everybody how to properly plant a tree. And then everyone went out and the rain had just cleared. So it was a little muddy that day, but it was great to see so many new trees being planted along one of our trails. We had the outdoor courts <coughs> refurbishment ribbon cutting. And you can see the big crowd turned out, including the Red Raiders basketball players and the mascot from the uh, Niagara River Lions, and I was joined that day by Councillors Patel and Newestag. And uh, I see Regional Councillor uh, Crater was there as well, and I noticed in our, oh, and Councillor Strange, I'm sorry, Councillor Strange uh, was there as well, thank you. And uh, we're joined by our two of our <coughs> three Regional Councillors, Councillor uh, Kim Crater and Joyce Morocco, thank you for being here today. And also we had the chili cook-off at Chip and Charlie's. And uh, of course, that was quite an experience when you put heat and beans together. A lot of interesting things happen. I was joined by Councillor Strange and uh, Patel. So great event with money going toward Heartland Forest to fix up all the damaged things that, were, uh, that happened there at the park that day and uh, as well for a commemorative bench for, for Jordy Pepperall. Thank you for that. I'd like to thank City Council for representing us at different events. Firstly, uh, Councillor Mona Patel for representing us at the Filipino delegation visit that took place in Niagara Falls. Thank you to Councillor Newestag representing the city at the Niagara Falls University Women's 100th year anniversary. And also Councillor Lococo representing the city at the community crew 
open house. There we go. Thank you to all council for representing the city. And this concludes the mayor's announcements. Lastly, to mention that our next regular council meeting will be Tuesday, November the 14th. So thank you everyone for your indulgence. So now I'm gonna to go to our city clerk who's gonna explain what's going on this next stage of our meeting. Uh, thanks, Your Worship. Uh, at this time, I'm recommending that we move forward on the agenda to item uh, number seven, which is our in-camera session of council. Uh, lately, we've been trying to do this uh, after the public uh, meetings and presentations. However, there is a session <coughs> in that in-camera session uh, that we do need to speak about before the planning public meetings. And just before that, I thought I'd give an update uh, for those who hadn't heard. Uh, the first matter that's on the agenda for the planning public meetings this evening is related to uh, planning report PBD 2023-62, and this is being referred to as the uh, Oakland's golf course lands uh, and uh, former uh, campground, uh, King Waldorf campgrounds there, uh, just along uh, Stanley Avenue. There has just today been a request from the applicant uh, to defer this matter uh, until a later date. Uh, so no decisions will be made uh, in council chambers tonight and there will be no debate on the, on the matter. Uh, staff are prepared to give a short presentation uh, when we start that portion of the agenda, but I just wanted the gallery to know that they will be given an opportunity uh, when this matter comes back before council um, at a yet to be known date, it will be uh, formally advertised and everyone will have an opportunity to speak. Uh, so I just wanted to give people that heads up before we go on camera. We will come back into open session and we will start with the planning matters and that topic will be introduced by staff, uh, but we, it will not uh, be up for debate or any decisions made this evening. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Clerk. Yes, Councilor Coco. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Just for clarification, will residents be able to speak after the presentation or is it just the presentation and then that's it? Mr. Clerk? Uh, because we didn't have a chance to uh, stop the, uh, the notice that was given out for the planning public meeting, uh, we will not uh, turn anyone away. Uh, but I would uh, strongly suggest that if someone did want to speak, uh, that they be uh, prepared to speak when it does come back as an official uh, public meeting under the Planning Act at a later date. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Mayor, to the clerk, if someone decides to speak tonight, will they be able to speak when it comes back, whenever that may be? Uh, yes, just through, through the, the mayor. Uh, yes, they could speak again at another meeting. However, we would ask that they not repeat any points that are raised uh, this evening. Um, and that's um, for the for the, the sake of uh, just keeping things running a little more smooth and it's also uh, a requirement under the Planning Act as well. And one final question. Uh, since it's being deferred, uh, you said that there's no opportunity for debate or decisions. Could it be deferred with um, conditions or just straight deferral and will we know when it's coming back? Mr. Clerk? Uh, as to the, the later item when it's coming back, I don't think that's been decided yet. That'll be a decision that I think the planning staff will come up with along with the applicant. Um, and as far as, a, we're not looking for any motion of council this evening. Um, so I, I don't know what your other items related to that deferral may be. Uh, we can deal with that at the appropriate time after planning staff have made their presentation. Okay, thank you. Thank you. So now we're, <clears throat> we're going to be going in camera for a period of time, you know, until we conclude what we need to do now, and then we'll be returning. So you do have some time. For those of you that want to reserve your comments until we can actually make a decision, you can do that. If you want to stick around, stick around. Uh, but we'll, we'll be returning after we're finished our in-camera meeting. So I'm now looking for a motion to go in camera. Moved by Councillor Neustag, second by Councillor Strange. All those in favor? Okay, so we're now gonna go in camera and we'll see you back here when we finish up.
Welcome back, everyone, to our regular scheduled meeting of Tuesday, October the 24th. Uh, we just concluded our in-camera meeting, and we're now here back in open session. I'm going to uh, pass the mic back over to our clerk, where he can lead us through our uh, first planning matter, 5.1. Mr. Clerk, the floor is yours. Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, Normally, this is where I would state that a planning public meeting is now being convened, but instead I will, I will state that a public meeting was to be convened until we had the request for deferral from the applicant today. And it would have been to consider a proposed amendment to the city's official plan and zoning bylaw uh, to accommodate approximately 1,344 dwelling units consisting of 679 detached dwellings, 155 on-street townhouses, and 510 multi-residential units, along with commercial uses, parks, trails, uh, a stormwater management pond, and sanitary pumping station. And this was at uh, 9015 and 8970 Stanley Avenue, lands to the east and west of 8970 Stanley Avenue, and lands on the south side of Lions Creek Road, east of Stanley Avenue. Notice was given by first class mail in accordance with the Planning Act on September 22nd, 2023, and by posting a sign in question. Um, I'm going to skip over any part about uh, uh, appeals and the OLT process. Uh, we'll save that until we hold the actual public meeting at a later date to be announced. And in, instead at this time, we'll just ask the mayor to introduce the planning staff uh, to go over briefly uh, the report. Okay, and uh, Councillor Peter Angelo is gonna excuse himself as he's declared a conflict on this matter. And I'll now, now uh, ask our uh, general manager of planning, Ms. Dolch, if you would introduce your uh, planner who's going to be taking us through this process. Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, I would like to introduce uh, Mackenzie Cece. She's our new um, planner here at the city. Thank you. Good evening, Mayor, Council, staff, and area residents. Thank you for joining me this evening uh, to review the official plan and zoning bylaw amendment applications AM 2021-016 and AM 2022-015 for 9015 and 8970 Stanley Avenue and the surrounding lands. The subject lands, which are highlighted in blue on this slide, are comprised of six separate parcels of land, including 9015 Stanley Avenue, 8970 Stanley Avenue, and four parcels that do not have municipal addresses. The subject lands previously operated as the King Waldorf's Tent and Trailer Park and the Oakland's Golf Club. The remainder of the lands are currently vacant. The lands are bisected by Stanley Avenue and are bound by Lions Creek Road and Lions Creek to the south, the Welland River to the north, the Chippewa community and the confluence of Lines Creek and the Welland River to the east and vacant industrial lands to the west. 46 industrial facilities associated with the Stanley Avenue Business Park are located on the north side of the Welland River within one kilometer of the subject lands. The subject lands are approximately 82.9 hectares in area and are designated resort commercial in part, open space in part, environmental protection area in part, and environmental conservation area in part in the city's official plan. And the lands are also zoned tourist commercial zone in part, industrial zone in part, and conservation open space zone in part in accordance with zoning bylaw 395-1966. The proposed applications would facilitate the future development of approximately 1,344 dwelling units consisting of 679 detached dwelling units, 155 on-street townhouse dwelling units, and 510 multi-residential dwelling units, along with commercial uses, parks and trails, a stormwater management pond, and a sanitary pumping station. The proposal would yield a net residential density of approximately 29.78 units per hectare. To facilitate the development proposal, the applicant is requesting to redesignate the subject lands to residential in part, minor commercial in part, and environmental protection area. 
Further, the applicant is requesting to place the lands under a special policy area that would require the completion of specified study work prior to the consideration of subsequent applications under the Planning Act. To implement the proposed land use designations, the applicant is requesting to rezone the subject lands to a site-specific residential mix zone in part, neighborhood commercial in part, and environmental protection area zone in accordance with the regulations of zoning bylaw number 79200. A neighborhood open house for the official plan amendment application was held on January 10th, 2022, and was attended by the applicant's agent and 46 area residents. A subsequent open house for the zoning bylaw amendment was held on September 13th, 2022, and was attended by 53 area residents. Written comments have also been received by numerous area residents, and the following concerns have frequently been raised, amongst others. Displacement of wildlife and habitat loss, traffic volume, and environmental contamination. With respect to the displacement of wildlife and habitat loss, due to the submission of incomplete information, it has not been sufficiently demonstrated that the proposed development will have no significant negative impact on the core natural heritage system, and this has informed staff's recommendation that's contained in the accompanying report. A traffic impact study was submitted with the applications and was reviewed by the city and the region, and the study recommended several intersection improvements, such as intersection signalization and the introduction of auxiliary turn lanes for the purpose of accommodating an acceptable level of service. And with respect to environmental contamination, uh, phase one and two environmental site assessments were submitted. Uh, there were uh, potential areas of concern identified and remediation will be required uh, prior to any um, changes in land use for these areas. Staff prepared a recommendation report, PBD 2023-62, that recommended refusal of the official plan and zoning by law amendment applications. The applicant has since deferred the recommendation report so that they can assess the numerous comments provided by staff, agencies, and the public. For this reason, staff recommend that council accept the request from the applicant to, to defer the recommendation report until such time that more information is received and a subsequent public meeting is scheduled with notice to be provided to all parties in accordance with the Planning Act. Thank you. Sorry, thank you very much. Uh, any questions of council from SCC? Okay, so I'm gonna pass it back over to our clerk and he's gonna continue us through the process. Thank you. So normally in a public meeting, this would be the time where we would ask uh, if any members of the public uh, do have any comments. Uh, I have been informed that uh, some of those that had pre-registered are willing to hold off until this comes back before council at a later date, uh, as the recommendation shows on the screen there. Uh, but uh, it is also understood that, uh, that there might be someone here that still feels that uh, they wanted to make comment tonight. Uh, and so I'll turn that back over to the mayor to invite uh, anyone here that feels they still want to make a comment from the public uh, before we uh, pass this off to the applicant or their representative uh, to make some final comments. So there will be a future public meeting where you will have an opportunity to address council and make your feelings known in addition to what you put in writing. So if there's anyone that feels they want to do it now prior to the public meeting, and, and a reminder, no decisions are being made tonight. Nothing is being debated tonight. So the applicant has requested that this be withdrawn for tonight, deferred to a future meeting until, as the, as the recommendation says, more information is gathered. So is there anybody here at this point who feels that they want to address council? If you do, you need to state your name, your address, and we can put that on the public record. And, and again, we would request that if you do speak today, that you not repeat the next time when the next public meeting comes up. And I'll remind you, you have five minute maximum as yeah, well. Thank you. I will be brief I, um there's just one um your name and oh, your guest please. yes john Bocker, um 134 church street st catharines thank you uh, one matter that came up at previous meeting was that it was thought that if the uh, niagara region provided more details about the uh, future of the uh new sewage treatment plant would help with this process because I believe that um, there will be a substantial buffer area it won't all be 
you know, sewage treatment plant and the buffers could, you know, deal with some of the pro concerns about wildlife habitat and, you know, Gary Hunter, who uh, was working on this issue, engineer said he was going to make a request under the Municipal Freedom of Information Act that the region hasn't provided this information. And the only other comment is that before the meeting that, you know, council votes, when this Aquifor Beach study is released, that the public have opportunity to, you know, talk about it, you know, at a public meeting before it, you know, goes to the, you know, planning staff for their recommendation to council. But okay. it's just those two points. Okay, thank you for that. And our staff are making note of that. So we will be prepared for the subsequent meetings. Yes, uh, Ms. Dolch, you want to comment on that? Thank you. Just briefly, the Aquaphor Beach study is part of the secondary plan process, so I don't know if that will be available prior to um, dealing with the environmental matters. Obviously, we're looking for the applicant to address the environmental concerns with their environmental consultant. Um, we will work with the region and NPCA as well. Um, if Aquaphor Beach's information is ready at the time, that's something we can, we can share and factor in. That's great. Thank you for that. John Morocco, 4739 Lions Parkway. Different being back here again. But um, first of all, I want to compliment the planning staff. I swore I'd never read 500 pages again, but apparently I do. So very thorough, very diligent work. I also want to compliment regional planning staff as well. Very thorough, very diligent. This is under a secondary plan study right as we speak. You're halfway through that secondary plan study. That is a citizen's focus group that you are using, and congratulations to you because you've done that process. If you end run this program, what you're saying to those citizens, your voice really doesn't matter. That's not the way this is supposed to work. That is why it should go through the proper planning process, be completed. This should not be adversarial. We should not be here fighting. We should all be in agreement on how to use this land properly and how it all can be done. The plan recognizes at some point in time there's going to be development in there. And that's great. Let's get it done the right way. Let's just not jam it in and do it the wrong way. I'd like to see a little bit of a change into that recommendation. I would like to see some verbiage in there to say at such time as the secondary plan and all associated studies are completed. This should not be coming back before that. And I would hope no member of council would entertain that unless it goes through the proper process. We have seen at the provincial government what happens when you run. It doesn't work. You go slow. You get it right. You're not having to backtrack. You're not having to retract. There are, right now, because of what has happened at that provincial level, there are hundreds of thousands of dollars trying to be recouped now from planning staffs that did all kinds of things. And now it's gone. Slow it down. Get it right. Let's work with the developer. Let's get this a good plan in place, okay? Jim, you're, you're, you love sayings, all right? If you fail to plan, plan to fail. Yeah. And when it comes to this type of thing where you measure twice, cut once, this is the environment. This is biodiversity. You better measure 10 times before you cut because this isn't a two by four you get to throw back in the stack. This is environment. Take the time, work with these folks collaboratively Let's get a good plan. Let's see it developed the right way. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> Folks, I would just please remind you uh, to maintain decor decorum, and that includes not clapping or booing. And we appreciate your passion. But uh, in this chamber, we ask that you not uh, express outwardly like that. Thank you. Yep, yeah, step forward, please. Hi, good evening. My name is Martine Israelian, 159 York Street, St. Catharines. Uh, with all the change, I wasn't able to kind of modify my presentation, so I'm just going to give her just like how I wrote it. So the clock can start now, I guess. Um, good evening, Mayor and Council. Uh, my name is Martine Israelian, and I am here requesting that Council refuse the official plan amendment and rezoning applications in line with the recommendations made by the City, Region, and MPCA. 
My professional background as an environmental consultant and terrestrial biologist has, has allowed me to critically review the applicant's EIS, which has brought to light substantial deficiencies that do not conform to the municipal and provincial legislative requirements. These concerns were submitted for public record on May 1st and remain unchanged following the amended EIS. I ask that Council defer any decision until the EIS aligns with the planning policies and once the Grassy Brook Secondary <coughs> Plan is finalized. I understand that some, of, some may look at the subject lands and see what appears to be a disturbed, abandoned field and wonder why we should be concerned. After all, the surrounding lands encompass extensive woodlands, wetlands, and major waterways where development is not currently proposed. However, when we take a broader landscape perspective, we begin to understand the remarkable and intricate ecosystem that this area represents. <clears throat> the connectivity of different habitat types is critical for the survival of many species. Frogs use the ponds on the subject lands for breeding, but may spend the summer or over winter in the adjacent woodlands and wetlands, or the raptors that require a combination of forest and grasslands for hunting. Disrupting any part of the ecosystem can have wide-ranging effects, so the loss of habitat on the subject lands can have far-reaching impacts if not developed appropriately. The areas surrounding the Welland River are under immense pressure. <coughs> There have been two secondary plans completed in recent years, Thundering Waters and Grand Niagara, and more recently, the Grassy Brook Second Plan. Um, other developments are being proposed or currently underway, including the hospital and widening of Montrose Road, uh, with the portion still in the EA phase. The Oakland's development and Grassy Brook Secondary Plan are in an even more sensitive area, bordered between ma three major waterways. Considering the cumulative impacts of multiple developments in the area is necessary for effective, urban and environmental planning, particularly as we continue to remove habitat and displace wildlife. In consideration of this, I would recommend that the Oakland's property, all or in part, um, are considered for compensation lands, which will be needed to offset all of those impacts associated with the surrounding developments. I want to emphasize that my concerns are not rooted in opposition to development. I am an environmental consultant, so I do this. So. Um, but are centered on a rezoning process that prioritizes compatible land use. It is possible to carry out development while simultaneously safeguarding the environment. I believe it is premature to consider rezoning in the absence of comprehensive studies that thoroughly assess the impacts of residential development and cumulative effects both on and adjacent to the su subject land. The current EIS, in my opinion, is more of an existing conditions report as part of a constraints assessment or pre-feasibility study. The report remains too generalized and omits crucial details about the proposed development, change land use, and overall impacts of mitigation, key components of an EIS. There is no mention of the potential impacts of residential de development, no mention of habitat loss through the removal of grasslands, trees, some of which are over 90 years old, ponds and wildlife corridors, no mention of noise, lighting, or increased human presence, and how this could further disturb and degrade ecosystems and alter wildlife behavior. No mention of increased traffic and how this can influence road mortality and how to mitigate that. The proposed buffers address fish habitat, shoreline protection, and water quality, but do not adequately account for wildlife habitat needs. Fencing is proposed within these buffers, which can act as a barrier to movement, negatively impacting wildlife. Further, the recommendations outlined in the report are, in my experience, nothing more than suggestions. These are not legally binding and the developer will not be required to follow through with these, especially if you decide to approve rezoning without a comprehensive EIS. So if your, deci to, uh, sorry, if your decision is centered on some of those recomm recommendations that are based on wording like should, may, or could, or consider, be very clear that there is no guarantee that they will be implemented. The report also includes recommendations for additional studies during the design stage. While these studies are warranted, it's prudent that they are completed as part of this EIS. These studies are crucial in assessing the potential impacts and in de determining the appropriateness <coughs> for rezoning for residential purposes. To conclude, it would be premature and imprudent to approve rezoning in the absen absence of a comprehensive EIS that considers this sensitive <coughs> landscape, type of development, and cumulative effects of surrounding developments. I implore Council to support the recommendations put, for, put forth by the City, Region, and MPCA and refuse this application. I believe this course of action is not only responsible, but the right thing to do. Thank you for your attention and consideration. Thank you very much. <coughs> do we have anyone else who uh, wishes to address Council tonight? 
going once. Yes, Mr. Clerk. I just wanted to point out that uh, <clears throat> there were two petitions submitted, uh, one by Leslie Lawn, one by uh, Marie Noves, both with over 300 names uh, requesting either deferral, denial, uh, or declining the application. And we can bring those petitions forward uh, when this does come back to council at the next uh, at the next scheduled public meeting, Councillor Lacoco. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I was wondering if one of our staff could explain um, what the deferral means and if we're allowed to add um, conditions to it and why we can't. Um, and if there's legislation, I've had a few texts already this afternoon. If there's legislation about an applicant removing. Um, a, an application and what the ramifications are. Um, I have talked with our legal and she said she could um, give that, but the other part of it is about the, um, that we can attach conditions. The application has been removed. Council is not, mm -hmm. not recommending anything, not denying it's been removed and we don't have any other options. Yeah. Ms. P uh, Pinarty, did you want to weigh in on this? Thank you, through the chair. So the authority to um, not deal with the matter that the applicant proposes is not ready for being dealt with comes from the Municipal Act. So specifically, Section 2 of the Municipal Act says that a municipality has broad authority to provide good and accountable government, and that includes um, the authority to um, regulate its affairs, regulate its affairs and its meetings. Um, in a way that um, the municipal council considers appropriate. If an applicant advances the argument that they are not prepared to fully deal with the matter and wish to address council at a later time when they are better prepared, um, that is a consideration uh, for council to consider and it has broad authority under the municipal act to um, uh, amend its procedures as, a fit, as council fits appropriate or sees fit or appropriate. Uh, Section 238 uh, of the Municipal Act also speaks to the procedural bylaw and its contents and um, case law under Section 238 uh, deals with the fact that um, Council can govern its affairs as it sees fit, um, including um, it is at liberty to alter or suspend its procedure as it sees fit and appropriate to provide good government. Section 273, which speaks to uh, quashing bylaws, the case law under that um, speaks to uh, what illegality means. So a bylaw of municipal council can be reviewed um, or quashed for illegality. Illegality has been interpreted to include procedural fairness and it is only procedurally fair to consider a matter from an applicant when they're fully prepared and comfortable to present. Thank you. Thank you very much. And one more question through the chair. Sorry, uh, one more question through the chair um, to Ms. Dolt. Could you let us know when the application is going to be coming back? Ms. Dolch? Thank you, Your Worship. Through you to the Councillor. Yes, of course, we'll let, um, uh, obviously, the Council will be aware as well as the general public. No, we I'm will, sorry, I mean, can you let us know now when it's coming back? Oh. Is it a certain date, a number of months, that sort of thing? Yeah, unfortunately, I can't let you know right now. Obviously, I have to wait. We're looking for further information. Obviously, there was a number of concerns in that report that we're waiting for more information on. Uh, we are hoping to schedule a meeting with, with the applicant and the agencies and ourselves. So. Um, I, once I know, I'll let everyone know. <laughs> thank you. Those are my questions. Okay, thank you for that. Any other questions of council? As far as speakers go, Mr. Clerk? I think that ends the, uh, the public portion. And we would, uh, of course, give the applicant or their representative uh, an opportunity to address council, uh, maybe give some explanation for the deferral, and if council has any questions of the applicant. Yep. Thank you, uh, Mayor Diodai, members of council, uh, staff and attendees. My name is Craig Rowe. I'm a senior land use planner with Upper Canada Consultants based out of St. Catharines. Uh, and I'm the agent that's acting on behalf of the landowners for these uh, two applications. So uh, as you've heard, um, we've requested a deferral of the consideration of this item. Uh, re we received a copy of the staff report on Thursday and have been working to try to take a look at a lot of those comments. As you know, there's a bit of a disagreement about uh, some of the aspects of the application and the materials that have been provided. Uh, some comments were provided to us for the very first time on some matters. Uh, so we feel it's appropriate that we can um, 
address those matters, provide that clarity, and as uh, Ms. Dolch alluded to, plan to have a meeting with the review agencies and get to the bottom of some of these issues. But um, in, in the interest of providing a little bit of clarity to the public tonight, um, a lot of conversations going on and also some clarity for council, I'd like to kind of provide a little bit of an abbreviated version of my presentation that I had, just talking a little bit about what the application is in the context and a little less about all the detailed uh, responses and rebuttals we had to things, but certainly I'm here to answer as many questions as you have this evening and feel free to uh, skip ahead to some slides that I'm not touching on. Okay. Mr. Clerk, do I have control with, with this to advance it? Keyboard? Keyboard, will do. <clears throat> um, so very simply, um, the applications that are before you um, for discussion tonight are an official plan amendment and a zoning bylaw amendment uh, for the lands on the west and the east side of Stanley Avenue, north and south of Lake. I'm gonna do that right now. Just okay. <laughs> Is he muted? Uh, he's muted okay, thank you. Okay. <laughs> That's okay. I'll try again. Uh, so uh, there's two applications that are that are up for consideration, and they those are official plan amendments and zoning bylaw amendments. Uh, so simply put, these applications are being brought forward as the first step in the redevelopment of these lands to set in place the land use designations and the zoning, so that we can move forward with things like draft plans of subdivision, the phasing of that development, and also any site plan approvals that may be required after that. So establishing these necessary residential and commercial and natural heritage land use designations and zoning provides certainty, it provides direction and justification for a client to undertake these future applications and to undertake uh, servicing design, uh, looking at development, working with architects for design, uh, and, and thinking about how we're going to build this community together. Um, the lands are currently designated as open space and resort commercial with some uh, bits of environmental protection, environmental conservation overlay. These designations that are in place uh, reflect previous land uses that are now defunct. It doesn't represent the current state of the lands. The official plan amendment proposes to apply residential land use to the majority of the property. A commercial designation is also planned at the southeast corner of Stanley Avenue and Lyons Creek. And in addition to that, uh, part of the official plan amendment is we've completed an EIS on the property that identifies all regulated, evaluated natural heritage features. Um, the mapping has been uh, field tested, so it's much more accurate than the existing mapping in the city and region's official plan. Uh, because it's been looked at on the ground and there's been buffers and protective measures that have been incorporated to that. So the takeaway that we're trying to have is that from a land use perspective, the designation on the land shows you where you can build residential, where you can build commercial, and what areas you cannot develop in and you must maintain. And there's certainly opportunities as a draft plan comes forward to talk about how we protect the interfaces between certain intensities of uses and those areas. The zoning bylaw amendment that we're proposing with this, it implements the official plan direction. So the approach to zoning that we've taken is a more flexible zoning approach that's going to use the R3 mix zone. So the site-specific zoning that we've provided has a full range of zoning provisions that are much more modern than bylaw 79200. A lot of things that you see in more modern subdivision development, things like uh, Warren Woods and some of the other developments that are out in that area, it provides a high degree of flexibility and allows for a more compact and urban design um, that we're doing there. And what what makes this flexibility palatable is the fact that we've also prepared a very detailed set of urban design guidelines. We've broken the development site up into nine precincts that each have a different development flavor. So when you're considering development in one of these areas, you'll be consulting the zoning bylaw and you'll also be consulting the urban design guidelines to say, is this where it proposes higher density development? What is the street composition like? How do the parks look? So these two tools together, we feel, provides a very, very clear and flexible way of developing the lands, which is good for the home building industry. People, uh, they have a little bit more flexibility for more innovative designs, multiple residential, things of that nature. We've already covered uh, the subject lands, and I'd just like to highlight the conceptual development plan. And, and just as a point of clarity, this is a conceptual development plan that showed how we theoretically could develop the lands. The only things that are firm and true on this plan that could not be changed are the locations of the environmental protection areas that we're proposing based on the EIS and the location of the stormwater management facility. It's the low spot on the development and we can't make water go uphill, so that's where it has to go. Some of the key points to know about the development of the lands is that they're very large. They're 82.8 hectares, that's about 204 acres in size. 
Of this area, excluding the natural heritage features we've taken a look at, 69 hectares of developable areas left over. So we've got about 83% left, which is a sizable amount of land that can help achieve a lot of good housing and growth goals. From that environmental work that we put forward, we have 13.83 hectares or 37 acres of land that's gonna be protected for the long term. This includes the feature itself and recommended buffers, which generally meet the, uh, the maximum buffer requirements that you see from the MPCA and Niagara region for these types of features. In addition to that, within the developable area, so that 83% we're dealing with, 6% um, of that land is proposed to be used for parklands and trails, so about 4.6 hectares. We've shown it generally in the center of the development where it could be walked to, cycled to, and most easily accessed by all those uses, especially closer to higher density uses where people would most likely frequent them because they wouldn't have a yard per se. Also important to understand about the proposed development concept, although it is conceptual, is that uh, our clients work a lot with uh, multiple residential and they work with rental. Um, the way that we've set this plan up is that we have a pretty much 50-50 split on the types of housing. Our zoning permits uh, a variety of detached units, so very small singles to typically larger singles, so everything from a 30-foot lot to a 50-foot lot. Um, and then to balance that out, we also have townhouses, apartments, and you can also integrate different kinds of plexes in there. And we've tried to sprinkle them around and basically permit them everywhere so we don't end up with a, a Euclidean zoning situation where everything is segregated. We want this community to be cohesive and work together and have some flexibility so we can be really innovative with what we're going to build. And just in terms of the population and what could be expected, we know that the city has a housing target. We know that there's a lot of people that are coming to Canada, coming to southern Ontario to live. Um, we have 1,344 new dwelling units that are proposed on this plan. If we take into account the population uh, ratios that we use when we calculate densities, that equates to over 3,000 new residents of Niagara Falls that could potentially be accommodated within these lands, which are already in the urban boundary and are in the built up area. So every start here is intensification. So these are just some of the cursory schedules we had and uh, I believe we've, we've touched on those. I'll just highlight just again for clarity, the yellow, this is the official plan amendment schedule. The yellow area is proposed for residential, the blue area is proposed for commercial, and the green areas are proposed for long-term environmental protection. The zoning bylaw permits the same, the orange area for residential, the blue area for commercial, and the green area for long-term environmental protection. So, um, I'll leave my comments there. Uh, certainly, I'm happy to answer any questions. I've submitted this slide deck anticipating any questions you may have. So if you'd like to um, move forward on and ask me any questions about that, I'm happy to answer those questions this evening. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Mr. Clerk. Uh, <clears throat> again, because of the deferral, uh, really weren't planning for any discussion, but if council does have any questions, uh, relating to the process or anything specifically to the presenter uh, we could entertain that now uh, otherwise uh, i think we're concluded for this portion of the agenda hey mr Ms. dolch is there anything further that you want to accomplish to this point okay so no okay so procedurally how do we move forward then uh, mr clerk uh, maybe we could have a motion just to receive the presentation and uh, we'll look forward to when this comes back to the council so we're looking for a motion by Councillor uh, Newstag, second by Councillor Strange. Yes, Councillor Lococo. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. If we're voting to receive the, the, the presentation in the application, no, the I thought presentation, we were, the presentation. The presentation. If, if, if we're still voting, I thought we weren't going to be voting at all because the application is not before us. We're if not we, voting, we're just receiving. We're not voting. We're still voting to receive it. Yeah, but we're not voting on the application. Any further questions? We'll call the vote. All those in favor to receive. Okay, thank you for that. Thank you for the presentation. Thank you to everybody that came out. Make sure your emails are on the email list so you can be notified and updated with uh, anything as the, as the application progresses. Appreciate everyone's time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We'll give you a few minutes. We'll just take five to let the uh, chambers uh, vacate.
three. Okay, welcome back. We've just allowed our uh, residents to vacate the chambers in a peaceful, orderly way. Now I'm going to ask our clerk to please introduce the next item on the agenda. A public meeting is now being convened to consider city-initiated amendments to the city's official plan. Public notice was given on September 22nd, 2023. Anyone who wants notice of the passing of the official plan amendment or would like to preserve their opportunity to appeal to the Ontario Land Tribunal shall give notice to the city clerk immediately after today's public meeting or by signing the sign-in sheets located outside of council chamber. Thank you, Mr. Clerk. I'm gonna ask, oh, where's our general manager of planning? Where did she go? I was gonna, she'll be back in a minute, okay. Well, I was gonna ask her to do the introduction and uh, Danielle Foley, there we go. Oh, there she is, oh, look at that. All I have to do is say it. So I'm gonna ask our general manager of planning if she'd be so kind as to introduce our, uh, our planning individual that'll be taking us through the next report. Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, I'd like to introduce Danielle Foley. She's uh, with the city now. She's our student planner who's been with us for a few years now. Uh, young bright star that will one day be director, I'm sure. Excellent. <laughs> Welcome, Miss Boy. Welcome. Thank you. All right, so good evening, Mayor Diodati, members of council, and members of the public. Tonight's presentation is regarding the city-initiated city official plan amendment for the delegation of authority for specific development applications. So Bill 13 has made changes to the Planning Act, which permits the delegation of approval authority to staff for specific development applications. This delegation does not alter notice requirements, public meeting requirements, appeal rights, or the requirements of a proposal to be consistent with provincial, regional, or loca local planning policy. Council has already delegated site plan approval to staff and delegated minor variants and consent applications to the Committee of Adjustment. So the list that development applications staff are recommending to be delegated can be seen on the slide. Um, the official uh, plan amendment proposes to delegate minor zoning bylaw amendments by introducing delegation and application criteria policies, introducing the scheduling of public meetings outside of council meetings, and updating terminology for the correct approval authority. And the proposed policies can be seen on the slide here. The, similarly to minor zoning bylaw amendments, the official plan amendment proposes to delegate draft approved plans by introducing delegation approval authority, uh, and application criteria policies and updating terminology for the correct approval authority. The proposed policies can be seen on the following slide. Additionally, the official plan amendment proposes to delegate community improvement plan simple grant applications, which are one-time grant payments valued at $25,000. And then this can also be seen in the proposed policies. Uh, the remaining applications will be delegated through the associated municipal delegation bylaw as they are not required to have official plan policies uh, to permit delegation under the Planning Act. An open house was held on September 14th and no members of the public attended. Uh, through written comments staff received, uh, it was proposed to establish a development review committee which would be comprised of all departments to ensure all interests are met. Staff responded that we currently have internal meetings between all departments to ensure that these interests are met. Additionally, it was recommended that a, develop, a dev development coordinator position was proposed so uh, that the coordination could be established for all development applications. Uh, staff responded that currently this coordination is the responsibility of the planner of the file to ensure efficiency and a lack of duplication of tasks. And lastly, a suggestion was made that the criteria for minor zoning bylaw amendments be clearly defined due to confusion with a minor variance application. Staff explained that the official plan amendment does include criteria, and since the difference between a zoning bylaw amendment and a minor variance application is currently a professional judgment by a planner, a policy was added in the official plan amendment to identify that the general manager or their designate would determine this type of application. So overall, staff recommend that council approve the proposed official plan amendment and municipal delegation bylaw as described in report PBD 2023-60. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, nice job, Ms. Foley. Do we have any questions of council for our planning? Yes, Councilor Lococo. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I'm not sure who this would go through. I had a couple of residents contact me about sometimes housekeeping changes um, are just 
a word change or a definition change, but sometimes they change the whole concept of what's going on. The, when we were talking about feeding animals and coyotes and squirrels, um, that change sort of changed the whole concept of what was originally there. So um, I, I just want to be cautious that housekeeping is really housekeeping and not changing the concept of what was originally there. Mm -hmm. uh, that was the one thing and that was it for, okay. for now. Yeah. So I don't know if you wanted to comment or uh, on that. So Councillor Lococo's concern is that housekeeping doesn't change the intent or the direction of things, that it's really, you know, minor in nature and it's just housekeeping. So I don't know if you had any feedback or insight or comment on that. Yeah, so through you, Mr. Mayor, thank you, Councillor Lococo, for your question. Um, in our OPA, we do have criteria to identify what deems something a, a minor zoning bylaw amendment. And for the housekeeping, we, we identified things such as like housekeeping and then the terminology changes, which wouldn't necessarily change the intent of um, the bylaw. And still, if something was changed, uh, notice would be given to whoever was affected. Okay, thank you. That's great, thank you very much. Any other questions? Yes, Councillor Neustag. Uh, with regards to the CI, uh, through you, um, with regards to the CIP grant, the $25,000, I understand that um, it's uh, something easy to enough to be delegated, but is there a threshold? So, um, for example, if we ended up with 30 um, applicants for a CIP grant, that would equal $750,000, which we know equals 1% um, tax levy. Is there a, a framework in place for that? Uh, perfect, yeah. So through you, Mr. Mayor, thank you, Councillor, for your question. Um, it would be uh, staff's direction. We're currently working on our CIP review to kind of evaluate these programs. Uh, so if it was delegated, uh, we have our financial tracking and we circulate uh, all our departments, such as finance. Uh, so if it was in the budget, we'd be able to approve. So there would be a limit, um, maybe well, through, yes. Through you, Mr. Yeah, Mr. Olch. Thank you, Your Worship. Through you to uh, the Councillor. So the way the CIP programs work currently is obviously we have a certain pot of money, um, you know, otherwise we, in certain instances. So the grants usually uh, that we would be talking about in this instance might be uh, facade improvements, things like that. There's a cap to those those grants, and that's why they, most times they're under 25000 So sometimes it's 10000 sometimes it's five. it's matched. Um, so those are the ones that, you know, we have so much money we award them um, obviously if anything was going to exceed budget requirements we would we would obviously let council know at that time uh, we wouldn't approve anything that wasn't uh, already planned or uh, within our budget criteria okay all right I think that answers I just see that one as being the one that has a little bit more um, it, more variables to it because if we're giving out money is it like where is it going to go and how is the, the different criteria in terms of who's applying for it and, and the pot of money. So that's just, that's the only one out of all of it that I see as being a little, um, could cause some potential problems in the future. That's and, just and a if, comment. Yeah, and if I may, I know we do uh, currently, unless we get an influx and, and it may happen with our new program, but currently we don't get a ton of CIP applications. Obviously, I don't know how many you've seen since your, your start here, but those are the ones we've received. Uh, so we don't get a ton right now. Obviously with a new program, we may see more. You s usually when you have a new program, it's fresh, it's new, people start applying again uh, for changes. Um, and that's something, again, we'll monitor you know, obviously the funding, we do have a reserve account as well, but uh, we'll work with finance to make, you know, obviously we'd never go over that uh, because it's the responsibility of council to, to decide that. All right, thank you, thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Any other questions of council? Okay, seeing none, members of the public are advised to fail to make an oral or written submission at this public meeting will result in the Ontario Land Tribunal dismissing any referral that it receives. Failure to notify the city clerk to preserve their opportunity to appeal will result in staff rejecting an appeal as per section 17 of the Planning Act. Council will now hear from anyone who wishes to speak to the proposed amendment. Is there anyone here, Mr. Clerk, who wishes to speak to the amendment? Uh, yes, Your Worship, we did have one uh, person uh, who had registered wishing to speak. His name is Mr. Peter Colosimo. Uh, he's approaching the podium now. Okay. Welcome, Mr. Colosimo. Thanks, Mr. Mayor, members of council. My name is Peter Colosimo. I reside at 6424 Jupiter Boulevard, Niagara Falls. I'm a retired professional planner, 40 years experience all around the region. 
I was also a former member of your Committee of Adjustment last term. Um, I provided comments to staff. Some of those were addressed in the report, uh, so I appreciate that. The comments that I did provide uh, related to improvements to the Committee of Adjustment, which is also a delegated authority under the Planning Act, uh, those comments weren't reflected in the report. I had some concerns expressed that I felt it was necessary for me to attend tonight to express those concerns and hopefully that council takes some action in the future. So, and I wanna say up front, I'm in support of the report. I think it's a good report. Uh, delegation of authority is certainly gonna uh, be beneficial to uh, all parties, certainly applicants, uh, to staff to save time for them and bottom line even for council, you know, for your meetings are gonna be quite long. You're already experiencing that tonight and other nights. So that's, that's a critical issue. When you do that though, delegating of, uh, approval authority as you are tonight proposed, you're no longer involved in the decision making. That's up to senior staff, which is fine. I think there, they should be accountable for that. For that. Uh, the benefits I've mentioned, there's an underlying importance through all of this too, is to respect the private and public interests uh, that go along with the applications, but also to maintain public trust and confidence in council, uh, including the decision making process. So you wanna make sure that that's still fair, reasonable, and so on. And I think it will be under what's proposed. The challenge that I have is consistency. I don't believe what you're proposing is consistent with your delegated authority that's happened for the Committee of Adjustment. Uh, I can give you a few reasons for that. One of them is under this proposal, uh, you're going to delegate minor zoning bylaw amendments to senior staff. I think it's fine. They can make that professional judgment. Uh, it should be appropriate. So that's delegated to senior staff to determine if a minor zoning <coughs> amendment should be in their bailiwick, if you will, for approval. But you're still gonna be making decisions on minor variances. That's uh, a problem for me that I don't understand why council would still be involved and be on the committee of adjustment for such minor applications that they're the lowest order planning applications you can have next to zoning amendment and a few other things here. So I would think that that would be a challenge for council because you have better things to do and a lot of uh, other committees and uh, important initiatives that are more strategic and more important planning uh, issues to deal with. So that's one of the challenges I see in terms of why is council still gonna be involved in the committee of adjustment. Some of the problems I see too is it's not clear in the Planning Act. You know, when you, when you set out your bylaw a number of years ago, the Planning Act just says um, you have to have at least three members. Uh, it doesn't give, it does say persons, it doesn't say counselors, uh, but it says that you may delegate, which says that you can keep it in your approval authority uh, or you can delegate to a committee. It references that uh, committee members, if they are members of the public, they have a four year term. If it's counselors, it's a one year term. I don't believe council's been doing that annually for the counselors that are on the committee to reappoint them, one challenge. But the other one is that speaks to me to say, if you're keeping the authority, you have a one year term. If, if you're uh, going to appoint citizens, it's a four year term. Makes sense. Why would you mix up that uh, uh, process, if you will, in terms of appointments to keep some clarity? So if anything, I think the plan Act says you should have one or the other. Either you delegate it or you keep the authority. Uh, your delegation bylaw 2014, it's outdated, it's not being followed. The bylaw actually says you're supposed to have nine people on the Committee of Adjustment, nine people. Uh, five are supposed to be counselors, four are supposed to be residents. Uh, you only have seven members on the committee, two are counselors, uh, five are residents. Uh, the fact the way your bylaw is written, basically says council still wants to be the decision maker, five to four, counselors to, to uh, citizens. That doesn't sound appropriate if you're delegating your authority under the Planning Act. Um, the, what's changed in the last 20 years or so though, since this bylaw was written? More accountability for council. You've got the Municipal Conflict of Interest Act that's come into place. You've got your code of conduct. That sets some really stringent rules about clarity of your role and function and the integrity of council and responsibility to public interest and public trust. Uh, it sets you to a higher standard. The Committee of Adjustment, I don't know if it's fully understood. I've written to the city a couple of occasions and even when I was on committee about some challenges on uh, conflict of interest and so on, but this committee is an independent quasi-judicial tribunal. It's not an advisory committee. It's not a special interest committee. It's got some interesting powers under the Planning Act. It's actually a local board uh, that's different than council. It doesn't report to council. Uh, it's expected, the only thing that council's really expected to do is certainly set up a bylaw, how the committee's uh, constituted, set up some rules and procedures, 
and, and so on. That's, that's council's number one role. Once you've delegated approval, wouldn't it make sense, just as you're delegating approval now to the senior manager, you're delegating to committee, local board, outside of council, independent uh, tribunal, if you will, that has to adjudicate matters. The issue of adjudicating is very important, different than any committee board that council has, because you're adjudicating. You get applications, you're considering input from the public, staff, and so on. It's an important role that you have to look at some of the uh, matters beyond the Planning Act. This I had to do a little re research for when I was on committee. So what is, as adjudicators, the role is bound by the administrative laws of Canada. And what that speaks to is promoting the public right to a fair hearing and partial decision-making process without bias. I had a problem at the uh, LPAT last year when I was on committee. I wanted to help out free of charge, not charging for planning services, thought I could help out to remedy the situation. I wasn't allowed not only to not be a witness, provide evidence, I just put in a statement as a uh, citizen. It got questioned, not just the city's lawyer said, you could be biased, we can't have you here for this hearing because you're on the Committee of Adjustment. Not only that, the lawyer on the other side said, we don't want even his, witness, his uh, statement as a citizen. Uh, again, bias potentially. They allowed my statement, but it raised the question of conflict of interest, which I advised staff at that time, you better look at that for not just Committee of Adjustment, but counselors who might be interested in attending a hearing um, or even Committee of Adjustment, should you be there? Should you even be decision makers is the real challenge. It really comes down to a matter of being a non-pecuniary conflict of interest. It's not one where there's money involved, it's because of your role on council. Council decisions that you're accountable for related to zoning bylaw amendments and plans of subdivisions that minor variances and consents deal with later. So you're making decisions on those applications as a, as a councillor and as representing the corporation of Niagara Falls. You're also involved in decisions to permit ac application for minor variances when your bylaw that you've approved is only two years old. Uh, you, have to, you, you need an application to get authority to go for a minor variance. And again, you adjudicate that, if you will. Lastly, council also, also has the authority to appeal a decision of the Committee of Adjustment or to not support the Committee of Adjustment, which I believe happened recently, and I know some residents were quite concerned and called me being a former member, uh, not that I could help them, but all of a sudden their rights as public to be involved in a hearing, have their matters heard, they're gone. Again, is this a conflict of interest, having councillors dealing with all of these matters as city councillors and also being on the committee? <coughs> that's the challenge I have, and that's where I believe there's a conflict. So I discussed this with the Ontario uh, Committee of Adjustment Association. The first words the former president said to me was, she said, you gotta be kidding. I said, well, that's, that's what it is. Um, and she basically cited the same things I'm saying to you. Uh, it's a conflict of interest to have counselors on there and certainly a bad practice. At the end of the day, uh, what I'm really asking for, I certainly support the, the proposal here. It's a good proposal. Anything to streamline planning um, and so on is, is good. Certainly anything that removes you from uh, you know, more minor type of planning matters I think is a good thing. Um, but I believe council has an obligation and a duty to consult its integrity commissioner as set out in your code of conduct because you need to build and maintain public trust. You also need to protect the integrity and the reputation of your councillors that are on the committee now or any future councillors on the committee. Keep in mind, um, you're supposed to be one year term for counselors. That's coming up this year. If you're gonna follow your bylaw, which I don't know that you have. So that's why I'm suggesting at the end of the day, at the very least, you need a lot of work to be done in your bylaw and some other housekeeping related to committee of adjustment, appointments, whatever. But you need to talk to your integrity commissioner. So what I'm suggesting as a first step, hopefully as a recommendation, as part of this uh, approval of this report, is to put a recommendation forward that staff be directed to immediately contact the city's integrity commissioner to determine if the appointment of councillors to the committee of adjustment meets the, meets the city's code of conduct. I think that's the least that should happen at this stage. Um, I, I've mentioned it before, and I think it's really important to the integrity of this council, uh, to the planning system, and the residents at the end of the day to at least get this looked at right away, uh, because December is supposed to be the time when you reappoint councillors, city councillors to committee of adjustment, if it's permitted. So those are my comments. I'm sorry to be 
a little bit long-winded. I haven't done this in a while, but uh, hopefully I've got my message clear and appreciate your, uh, your time. Thank you, Mr. Klausimo. Any questions for Mr. Klausimo? Okay, appreciate your time. Thank Great. you very much. Thank you. Councilor Coco. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I was speaking with Mr. Colosimo, so I thought I would do my own, my own research. And, um, you know, we always strive to do better and have good governance. So I thought I would go through a, a bunch of different municipalities and see what they had. Um, I probably did 12 um, Toronto citizen member panel, Richmond Hill, five members of the public, Town of Ajax, five public citizens. Then there's some that specifically said um, no members of council. Um, there, there was an issue in Richmond Hill, and they said that it was unprecedented for council members to attend the Committee of Adjustments. Councillors must not be involved in Committee of Adjustment decisions. I've talked to Ms. Dolch as well back in March when we were talking about this. There's nothing in the Planning Act that says we can't do it. We're um, maybe looking at something different. It's not that we're doing something wrong. It's just that there's better ways of doing it. I found one municipality that has three members of council, but they didn't choose to delegate the authority to um, a committee. We have lots of different committees within the, the city, and those are all advisory committees, not delegated authority committees. Um, the city of Guelph actually uh, put a guide together, and it said that um, it should respect delegated approval authority, don't attend committee of adjustment meetings, don't use political position to presume or influence members. So nothing against the, the committee or staff of how we've been doing things, but if it's brought to our attention, I think we should look at um, doing something better for good governance. Um, there was just one other thing I wanted to say. Um, some of the other terms that I found about operates independently from council, autonomous from city administration and council, and that it's a quasi-judicial body. So th that was the research that I've done, and I'll put it out to the, the council to see where the, they'd like to go with it. I would be in support of maybe the motion that Mr. Um, Colosimo put in that we contact our integrity commissioner to find out um, their thoughts on it. Any uh, discussion or comments of council to uh, the presentation and to Councillor Lacoco's uh, comments? Yes, Councillor Strange. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I don't know if anyone can, t if, if, if it's, is it part of the Planning Act where we're allowed to have councillors on this? We, we have two councillors now that are doing, they're doing a fine job, and I know uh, Councillor Peter Angel has been on, on the Committee of Adjustments for as long as I can ever remember. And doing a great job. I don't. Is there anything in the planning act that says we can't have councillors? And why would it be one-year terms? It doesn't make sense to me. We don't do that with any other committee. Yeah, it okay. makes sense to, to align it with the residents. If it's a four-year term, it's a four-year term. Yeah. We keep doing it every year. You got to. It, it sounds ridiculous to me. Yeah, it seems that. So maybe Miss Dolch, I don't know if you can weigh in on this. So first of all, why are we one year on the council ones? And uh, and I don't know whether you and the clerk or how you're going to you know, work uh, tag team this. And, and secondly, what's the uh, Municipal Act say? Is this, is it allowed? Is it discouraged? Thank you, Your Worship. And, and again, I can speak to the Planning Act. I'll, I'll leave Mr. Matson to speak to the Municipal Act. In terms of the Planning Act, obviously, you have the ability, you can, you can delegate your authority down to a local body or a, a committee of adjustment. So that's what the Planning Act said. In terms of the composition, that's more um, under the Municipal Act and under that requirement. So in terms of the delegation bylaw, the one-year term, again, under the delegation bylaw. So I'll have Mr. Matson speak to that. Mr. Matson, Ms. Pignarty, whoever wants to argue over this one? Yeah, off the cuff, uh, I don't have an answer. I, I, I heard Councillor Lococo say there's nothing in the Planning Act uh, that says you can't appoint, uh, based on her, her quick research. Uh, that's something that we could, uh, staff could take back and look into further, uh, as, as well as the uh, bylaw that was mentioned about a one-year term. Uh, obviously, we have not uh, uh, followed that in the past. Uh, we have had Council make a motion to appoint for a four-year term. So. Uh, we can take that as direction to look into that further. Yes, Councilor Coco. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Will the information also inquire uh, an inquiry with the Integrity Commissioner to ask them? Is that part of the information that you're going to bring back? I'll put a motion forward if need be. Uh, I, I know you mentioned as adding that to the motion when the public meeting closes. Uh, I'll wait for that direction. Okay, um, I'll, I'll put a motion forward to it. Well, we're not oh, finished sorry. yet with the planning. So once the public meeting's done and then we can entertain motions and see, is there, um, so where are we here now? Is there any other member of the public who wishes to address council on this? 
Okay, are there any other questions or comments of council? Okay. So the public meeting with respect to the proposed official plan amendment is now concluded. <coughs> yes, Councilor Coco. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I'll put a motion forward to accept the report and in addition to that, uh, for the clerk's department to look at other information and contact the integrity commissioner to get advice from, from them. And when you say uh, contact the integrity commissioner specifically for what? For a conflict of interest um, uh, requ um, inquiry to find out if having counselors on a committee of adjustments, if there is a conflict of interest. I'm gonna just get some feedback here. I've got uh, uh, Councillor, uh, just before I get yeah, staff going away and then I'll come to Council Exchange, Mr. CAO. Uh, thank you, through the chair. I think the challenge with a conflict of interest when you speak generally, conflict of interest normally comes down to facts, right? Um, there's planning matters that come to council that a councillor may say, listen, I have a conflict of interest here. You can't say blanketly that I have a conflict of interest in planning matters. Um, and in this case, with Committee of Adjustment, you know, from a materiality point of view, it is very small items that you're dealing with and very specific items that you're dealing with. Um, so I think, you know, we can refer to uh, the Integrity Commissioner, but he's going to say, well, what's the fact base on the conflict of interest? And what are, you know, you can get the generic answer of, yes, you may have a conflict of interest. Depends on the facts. No different than when a planning matter comes to council you may have a conflict of interest. Uh, so the, you know, to me the issue is, are you going to change your composition due to the potential for a conflict of interest uh, on the committee, or are you not going to do it? You know, to go and, to be frank, to go and pay the integrity commissioner to weigh uh, the possibility of a conflict of interest when yes, there is always a possibility of a conflict of interest depending on the facts that I can probably give you that answer now, or another lawyer can give you the answer that there's always that possibility of it. I think the broader question is, um, you know, is, is that is, is that the reason for making a change in composition? If you want to make a change in composition, that could be one of multiple reasons to do it. But, um, you know, when you look at the materiality of the issues, as the speaker said, you're dealing with very minor issues uh, on a committee of adjustment. So, if <clears throat> that's something that you want to not have council deal with well then that's up to council to 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 make that decision but conflict of interest question it's going to come back to what is the fact set of of that and yes you can always be put in a conflict of interest no different than you know planning matters that come to council you're going to be in a conflict of interest depending on the fact set that's there i'm going to go to miss dolch i can't go back to mr Klosmo. i've closed the public meeting now so i thank you for that i'm going to go to miss dolch for further comment Thank you, Your Worship, and I just wanted to correct myself. I apologize. In terms of the Planning Act, it does say members of the committee shall hold office, or sorry, members of the committee who are not members of the municipal council shall hold office for the term of council that appointed them, and the members of the committee who are members of municipal council, council shall be appointed annually. So that's where Mr. Klausman was talking annually. So it does it does indicate that members of the committee who are members of council need to be appointed annually under and the Planning in Act. And that's in the in the Planning Act. It's in the Planning Act. So, yeah, and in the bylaw, as Mr. Falsmo okay. indicated. But I just wanted to clarify that it is in the catch. Planning Act, so I just didn't want to uh, mislead anybody. Uh, okay. That, um, thank you, Mr. Yeah. Mayor. I have d directly about that. Uh, thank you to the CAO. The way I was looking at it wasn't that it was a conflict of interest per topic. It was a conflict of interest from a delegated body, of that delegated body to be on that committee. That was the first one. And I think... I kept on reading the, the line that Ms. Dolch just did. So if council does not delegate to another body, they can have a certain number of councillors be the committee of adjustments. They are members of council. That's where the term of one year comes in. So it doesn't necessarily mean it's one year for councillors who are on the committee and four years for members. It could mean, and it's not clear, it could mean that it's one year for councillors who are on the committee of adjustments who did not delegate their authority. So I, I went through that quite a bit to understand that and I kept on reading it and that, that's sort of where I got it. If we did not delegate and we had say three councillors, their term would be one year. That's what I read out of it. Because that, that line is under term of office, not under um, the composition. So maybe we can go to our solicitor and get um, comment on, um, on that. Yes, go ahead, Ms. Dolch. 
Perhaps just while Nitty or Mr. Pinieri prepares, I, I just wanted to state though, it is under section 44 of the act and section 44.1 talks about the municipality passing a bylaw under section 34 uh, that appoints a committee of adjustment uh, for the municipality composed of such per persons, not fewer than three, uh, as the council considers advisable. Then you go down, subsection three of that is terms of office for that committee of adjustment and that's where that statement comes. So I do believe that it refers to the Committee of Adjustment because it's within that section, subsection. Yes, I can see, um, through, the, through the chair, I can see how that can be, but if your if you're, um, committee can be um, councillors and community members, our bylaw says it should be one year appointed for councillors and four year term for me members of the public. So the term of office is also saying if we, we did uh, appoint three members of the council, they would have to be um, appointed annually. So anyway, I don't want to argue about that point, but my point to the conflict of interest was not a specific subject, but a conflict of interest after a delegation of a council was given to um, the committee. That was the conflict of interest. Yeah, and through the chair, the, the role of the integrity commissioner um, is not to sort that out. Like I think the better position is if you want to report back from staff or from legal counsel on that, the integrity commissioner's role uh, is to uphold the, you know, the code of conduct, which conflict of interest comes under, not to give general advice. And so if you want general advice on, you know, how they should structure it, I would suggest you can go there, but I don't think that's really the role of the integrity commissioner. You can ask for a report from staff, which can provide you some of that, or provide counsel as a whole, uh, with some of that background, but you know, uh, to, to you know, generally the integrity commissioner provides individual advice to council. You can provide council as a whole, but it, it's a fairly, you know, it's a fairly broad question, and it's not like we're the only municipality doing it. There are municipalities out there with council members on uh, this, so it's going to be hard for him to say, well, this is, a, you know, there is a conflict of interest because the next question is going to be was well, what about the other municipalities that are doing it okay, so understood. you know I, I think if it's a best practice issue you can get advice from uh, council but uh, you know I'm not sure I'd be turning to the integrity commissioner uh, for a report on that because I think you can get, get, get better resources from the staff internally here but it's up to council uh, um, thank you, Mr. CEO, and through the mayor. And, and going through best practices, I, I researched 12, and only one had three members of council. All the rest either didn't have council member names on it or specifically said not including council. So I, I would just like to do good governance. So if we could get a report, I'll remove the um, Integrity Commission portion of uh, my motion, and if staff can come back from a legal aspect. I know it doesn't specifically say not to have councillors in the Planning Act, um, and interpret that part about the one year for the term of office for that council <coughs> member. Is it referring to a council, uh, a committee of adjustments of councillors, or is it referring to a council member on a committee with other members? It's not very clear, and I just want to do the best governance. Okay, so there's a motion by Councillor Lococo for clarity on the, um, um, how, would we, how would we describe that? On our bylaw. On our bylaw for the appointment of our councillors on the Committee of Adjustment, the one-year term. Is that, is that right? Am I not just our bylaw, but the, the planning act of the composition, the terms of office, not just our bylaw, because we're not even following our bylaw right now either. The bylaw currently says nine members and five councillors. And one-year terms, okay. So we're looking for clarity uh, to, to explain, but we're not going to the Integrity Commission, is that right? Okay. Yes, Councillor uh, Patel. Through you, Mr. Mayor, do we really need a motion, or we can just ask for a staff's report? Procedurally, because we're in a, like, you know, the pro thing we're in right now, Mr. Clerk. What would we do? What's the proper way? Uh, since we have a motion on the floor to recommend the, uh, or to approve the recommendations in the report, this was simply just an, an addition to that okay. recommendation. So procedurally, I don't see a problem with that. Um, we're still looking for a seconder. So your motion is also to approve the recommendation, and the second part is the, okay. Uh, pardon me? For the staff report. For the staff report, right, okay. So yes, uh, Ms. Pinerti. 
Thank you. Through the chair, um, I can offer an opinion on the Planning Act right now. Uh, Ms. Dolch is correct that the term of office and that provision that she read of refers to the Committee of Adjustment term for whichever member it may be, whether it's um, a council member on that body or a non-council member. So the term of office in that Section 44 of the Planning Act refers specifically to the term on the Committee of Adjustments and not to any other term, if that was the question. But if there was a wider question, um, I'm happy to take that because I'm not clear on what the question is so that I can prepare the uh, report properly. Okay, yeah. so uh, Ms. Uh, Councilor Coco, you, could you maybe uh, go through it Yeah, again? I'm a little confused. Um, no, it wasn't a question about, um, the, it was a question about the term of office for a councillor. Was it a, a question about a, a councillor created um, committee of adjustments? So you can have three councillors on it if Council does not de designate to um, a public body um, of, of members. So is it one year for a councillor as one of those three people, or is it saying it's one, one year for a councillor as part of a, a committee of adjustments that have citizens members? So it, it doesn't say that you can't have councillors, but there's almost tw um, 12 municipalities here that don't, and they must have it for some reason. The idea is behind conflict of interest, keeping council out of decisions, that sort of thing. So then the Planning Act says about the one year for council members. But is that saying one year for council members in a mixed group of a committee of adjustments or a group of three councillors? That, that it's a little bit different than, I don't mean to mix it up, but it's two different things and it's unclear is my point. Ms. Pignarty? Thank you, through the chair. I'm happy to deal with that right now. So 44 subsection one speaks to three persons. It doesn't speak to council members, so that's number one. So it doesn't say it's three council members, it says the body has three persons, right? And the rest of that section actually contemplates a mix, right? It speaks to a specific term limited to one year for council members, um, and it leaves the other one open-ended. So the legislation actually contemplates a mix of council members and non-council members, but it doesn't mandate um, every municipality referring to the previous advice that given on a different matter has the ability to um, design a procedure um, that you know reflects, reflects the Planning Act and um, in their discretion they can best decide what suits um, the governments they wish to adopt, if that addresses your question. It, it does address the question and, and that is our legal advice. Um, I, I would just like to look into maybe the Municipal Act, the Planning Act, and see if there is um, a, a different description or a different um, perspective on this because it doesn't seem that we're following what others are following, and I just wanted to know why. Okay, so then can you just rephrase the, the motion? So in addition to the approving the recommendation, you're asking for a staff report to clarify, just so I understand, So because I need a seconder yet, so I understand what it is investigate the Municipal Act, the Planning Act, and our bylaw, and, and report back. On the appointment of councillors on Committee of Adjustment? Correct. Okay. And it might come back that there's there's no issue, but there's there's um, um, those two bodies plus um, the Planning Act, the Municipal Act, plus our own bylaw, which we're not following. Okay. Uh, councillor Strange. Uh, thank you, Mr. Moore. Didn't we not just get a clear, a clear answer from our lawyer that everything is... She answered all the questions. Yes. To you, to you, Mr. Mayor, can we do both motions separate then? Yes, you that can. That makes it more sense. Yes, we can. Yeah. We can split it. Yes. If that'll be easier. So, um, how, what's the best way to do this, Mr. Clerk? Well, we do have a motion on the floor, and I don't re recommend removing it unless the the uh, councillor wants to remove it herself. Uh, so the best thing to do right now is look for a seconder to that motion. If you don't get our seconder, then I think you have your answer. Okay, then we have our answer. Otherwise, yes, Council. I'll, I'll remove it. Okay. Um, so I'll put two motions forward, one to accept the, the report, and then a second one to come back with further information about the composition and councillors, look at our bylaw municipal act and the planning act. Okay, so I need a seconder to uh, approve the recommendation. Councillor Patel. Okay. This is the council approve the amendments that his official plan adopt the delegation bylaw as outlined in the report. Okay, okay we already got our uh, second over here. Yeah. Okay, we're going to call the vote. All those in favor. Oh, did you want to speak to it? Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. 
Yes. That's okay. Yeah, Your Worship, I just wanted to say, I mean, I like the report. I, I think oftentimes we talk, we talk all about, you know, how we can streamline um, City Hall. Uh, this is one of the best ways. I mean, I think our staff are very uh, competent in what they do. Uh, when I take a look at a lot of the things that are in here, I think to myself that Council has already approved a lot of these things. All we've done is we've passed it back to staff, such as a holding symbol. A holding symbol will have a number of different, um, uh, I, I guess, uh, criteria aligned with it that the applicant therefore has to fulfill in order for that holding symbol to be lifted. And oftentimes, well not oftentimes, all the time, a holding symbol up until now has to come back to City Council. So city staff have to write a report and then there's the two or three week delay in terms of getting it to council and then you gotta wait for approval and then sometimes there's an appeal period. So it makes a lot of sense to actually pass it back over to, uh, to staff. I had to chuckle when I read the report because it says that uh, if council approves this report, um, oh no wait, it says that we're gonna free up council time. I think we're gonna free up staff time, your worship. And it says that in the report, it says that two to five weeks uh, for every applicant we're gonna save. So it's a great way to streamline. I'm definitely in favor of this report. In terms of the Committee of Adjustment, Your Worship, because I'm one of the members that sit there, I'm gonna stay out of that one, so. Okay, fair enough. Any other comments to uh, this part? Okay, yes, Councilor Patel. Through you, Mr. Mayor, to Ms. Dolge. I remember in March when we talked about this uh, streamlining process, I asked about the uh, report, how many we approve, how many we didn't approve, like, you know, quarterly report to see what staff has done, so at least we have an idea what's going on. Storch? Thank you, Your Worship, through you to the Councilor. So we do provide that quarterly report where we provide how many applications we do um, and break it down. And I apologize, I, I missed that in, okay. in this report, but I can get that to you by email uh, if that's of assistance, how many. And I don't know if Danielle, you might have that information at all, or, or Julie, how many reports we've approved that they would, would be delegated. I don't think we broke that just, down. The, and just I for our information, Natalie, and then somebody asks us questions, at yep. least we have a deal with you. I definitely I'll get that to you. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you for that. There's no further questions or comments. Let's call the vote on the recommendation. All those in favor? Okay, and that's approved. And then uh, Councilor Lococo. Well, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I'd like to put a motion forward for staff to bring a report back um, looking at the Municipal Act, the Planning Act, and our current bylaw, and the composition of the committee, including councilors. Okay, do we have a seconder for this motion? Is there a seconder for this? I don't think we have a will for this, Councillor. Okay, thank you. Well, we did have good discussion. We did get legal input and planning input, so it did get addressed. So, uh, appreciate that. Thank you um, on that topic, everyone. So, we are gonna move along. Do the same one. Okay, so we're moving along in our agenda, uh, folks. And now I'll ask our clerk to introduce the next item on the agenda. Public meeting is now being convened to consider a proposed amendment to the city's official plan and zoning bylaw to permit two additional dwelling units uh, as of right on parcels of urban residential land containing a detached, semi-detached, or an on-street townhouse dwelling for a total of three dwelling units on a lot. Notice was given by first class mail in accordance with the Planning Act on September 22nd, 2023, and by posting a sign on the property in question. Anyone who wants notice of the passing of the official plan and zoning bylaw amendment, or preserve their opportunity to appeal to the Ontario Land Tribunal, shall give notice to the city clerk immediately after today's public meeting, or leave their name on the sign in sheets located outside council chamber. Thank you, Mr. Clerk. Um, so I, I think I'm asking our planning, is it our director I'm asking or whom I'm asking? I'm just gonna go right to the general manager of planning and if, see if she would please uh, explain the purpose and reason for the proposed amendments. Thank you, Your Worship. And I'm gonna introduce Daniel Foley again, our okay. student planner. She's taking over the wow. new additional dwelling unit ADU policies. Big day, two for two, welcome back. Yeah, so once again, good evening, everyone. Um, tonight's presentation is about the city initiated official plan amendment and zoning bylaw amendment for the additional dwelling units. So recent changes to the Planning Act from Bill 23 has permitted two additional dwelling units or ADUs on a single parcel, parcel of urban residential land as of right for a total of three dwelling units. 
So municipalities are not permitted to pass official plan policies or zoning bylaw provisions to restrict the use of these ADUs. And regardless of council's decision tonight on this OPA and ZBA, uh, property owners are still legally permitted to create three units on a parcel of land in the urban area which have residential as a permitted use under the Planning Act. So for a summary of our official plan amendment, uh, we're, we propose to change the general housing policies by updating the existing policies to include duplexes as a typology permitted to have ADUs and introducing policy to allow one ADU in the good general agricultural area. Uh, we propose to amend terminology for consistency and ensure consistency of ADU policies throughout the official plan. So as could be seen on the slide, uh, these are the amendments to the existing housing policies in the official plan. Uh, for the zoning bylaw amendment, uh, staff proposed to add the definitions of parcel of urban residential land and parcel of rural residential land. Uh, this is to align with terminology used in the Planning Act and then to delineate urban and rural ADUs. Uh, the, for ADUs in the urban area, the zoning bylaw amendment introduces provisions to permit a maximum of two ADUs for a total of three dwelling units on a lot for the permitted housing typologies. And then for clarity, the composition of the maximum number of dwelling units can be seen in the chart. Uh, so you could either have three dwelling units in the existing dwelling for a total of three, or you could have two dwelling units in the existing dwelling and one additional dwelling unit in the accessory building for a total of three units. For ADUs in the rural area, uh, the zoning bylaw amendment per permits a maximum of one additional dwelling unit for a maximum of two dwelling units. Uh, for clarity, again, this composition can be seen in the chart. So you could either have two dwelling units in the existing dwelling for a total of two, or one dwelling unit in the existing dwelling and one in the accessory building for a total of two. Uh, additional provisions in the zoning bylaw amendment include requiring one parking space per ADU which may be provided in tandem and this is required under the Planning Act with Bill 23 changes. Um, additional uh, provisions include for ADUs in accessory buildings, many of the provisions that apply to other accessory buildings apply which are rear and yards, interior, side yard setback, sorry, um, maximum lot coverage and then maximum height. Uh, for ADUs within rural areas, we've required that they cannot be located within a building used for any agricultural use. They must uh, comply with minimum, minimum distance separation requirements. And for rural ADUs in an accessory building, they cannot be located more than 15 meters from the existing dwelling. Um, in terms of public comments, an open house was held on August 23rd and one member of the public attended. Uh, staff were asked about the process of building an ADU and explained that a guide will be provided at a future time, um, but it will gen generally follow the building permit approval process. Uh, staff were also asked about fees related to ADUs. Uh, we explained that um, ADUs are exempt from development charges, uh, again, another Bill 23 change. However, building permit, f building permit fees apply and are based on the size of the ADU. Um, Additionally, questions were asked about connecting to existing infrastructure. Uh, if the ADU is in the urban area boundary, they are required to connect to the existing municipal infrastructure. And if they are in the rural area, they are required to have private servicing, whether that be on the existing septic or if they need an expansion to accommodate. Um, through written comments, staff were asked about including duplexes as a housing typology uh, to allow ADUs. and. Well, it's not required under the Planning Act, we have proposed to allow a similar number of ADUs in a duplex as it achieves the same outcome as a single detached dwelling having three units or a duplex having three units. Um, our recommendation is that Council approves the proposed official plan amendment and zoning bylaw amendment as described in Report PBD 2023-61. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Foley. Members, of, are there any questions, first of all, of Council for Ms. Foley? Yes, Councillor LeCoco. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you so much for your report. I really think this is a great uh, movement forward, but I did have some clarification questions. Um, you talked about not in a building that was used for agricultural use. If it was a barn that was used five years ago for animals and all of a sudden I purchase it, what is used 
do, is there a certain time period that it has to stay vacant from animal use? Can I never use it? Ms. Wall? I guess <laughs> yeah. Sorry. So, no, that's okay. Uh, through you, Mr. Mayor, thank you for your question, Councillor Lococo. Uh, Julie just informed me they would have to apply for a change of use permit um, to just prove that the building wasn't being used for any agricultural use. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, I know I was speaking with a, a friend who had um, an ADU. Her, she used her garage, but the only thing she couldn't do is hook it up to city services. It was going to cost her $70,000 to rip up her um, driveway to connect. Do you have um, some estimates of how much this is going to cost? Like, it's one thing to build it, but then if you have to connect to city resources, um, and I know everybody's would, would be different. Her garage was a little bit further. She had to come all the way down the, the concrete driveway to the city um, connection. What kind of costs are we talking about? I guess. <laughs> Ms. Dolch. Thank you, Worship. Through you to the Councillor. So, obviously, uh, Municipal Works now is looking at a connection uh, to the existing service on the site, not necessarily going right to the street. So, it may not go all the way to the driveway, it might need be able to connect. In terms of cost, we don't know. We do know that it could be, uh, and I don't know if Mr. Nickel has any general cost, but. Um, in terms of cost, in the future we may be looking at programs to help assist uh, residents in that area, but again, uh, something we're looking at right now. So I can't give you a ballpark figure. I don't know if Mr. Nickel has one. He's shaking his head no. Um, but generally, they may not have, previously they may have, we may have suggested to connect to the, the existing main on, on the street, but we now are looking at, as, as Mrs. Foley uh, recommended, that it would be connected to the existing service on the site. Perfect, thank you. Um, the Planning Act doesn't allow for a minimum size, and the maximum size is 40%. That's correct? Uh, through Mr. Mayor to Councillor Lococo, that was in our existing um, ADU bylaw. We had uh, the maximum 40% uh, provision, and we had a number of minor variance requests. I forget how many it was, it was in my appendix, right. but um, uh, we've noticed that that's been the main factor stopping people from being able to implement ADUs, so we've decided to remove that provision um, and not have any size, but uh, the other zoning provisions would still impact size in terms of setbacks, uh, maximum height, and overall lot coverage. Okay, great, thank you. And um, I, I wanted to confirm for some residents that the purpose of these ADUs in a residential area cannot be used for vacation rental units. It's for residents to live there, not vacation rental units. Right, so again, through you, Mr. Mayor, Councillor Lococo. Um, ADUs are not permitted to be used as VRUs in residential designations. Um, if they are in one of the tourist zones, as in our VRU policies, they may be converted. Uh, but again, they would need to com comply to all of our VRU policies, and they would also be required to have two parking spaces per unit, uh, in addition to the one that's required for a regular ADU. Great, thank you. Through the mayor, um, you led into my next two questions, my two last questions. Uh, can the Committee of Adjustments change the one parking space for an ADU? Can someone come to the Committee of Adjustments and change that? For more for parking number, or less? For, for less parking. Uh, yes, less. They could, Yeah. okay. And um, the last one is, if it was a commercial, you just talked about commercial, and they were putting an ADU in the back property, there's no, ma there's no um, maximum size. So you could have a commercial property with a huge backyard and somebody could almost build a second house? Uh, so the ADUs are only permitted in residential designations, not commercial. So yeah, it would have commercial. to be the, yeah, the primary use of the lot. Okay, so can I go back? You just said yeah. commercial a few moments so, ago. Sorry, I, I might have, so I meant tourist if I accidentally said commercial okay, for VRUs. So that that might have been tourist. a, sorry, let's tourist. Let's tourist yes. commercial. Maybe it's on Victoria Avenue. It's right. a tourist commercial. Yes. Can they build an ADU in the back? and there's no maximum of size? Uh, well, again, it would, the main use of the property would have to be residential. Okay. Um, and then the size would still be regulated through the overall lot coverage. So uh, it would be the 93 square meters and a balance of regulations of the overall um, zone that it's in. Um, so that would regulate the size of the accessory building, if that's what you mean as in that's the That's what I was yeah. getting at. Yeah. Thank you so much. You answered all my questions. Perfect. Thank you. Good job. Thank you. All right, I've got Councillor Patel, Councillor Strange, and then Councillor Newestay. And then Councillor Peter Angelo. Through you, Mr. Mayor, to Ms. Foley, or okay. Ms. Dolch. For example, if there's a one residential unit, they have two ADUs in the backyard. 
how does it work for ad, uh, like residential address? How does it work for the water meter or a hydro meter? Or and how does it work for the uh, income? Uh, sorry, for property taxes. Right. So with our with our provisions, you can actually only have one ADU in the accessory building in the rear. Uh, so you can only have one back there. And then in terms of addressing, when the building permit comes in, it, it'll go through our building department, who will contact GIS, and they usually assign a an A or B sort of thing. So we, we know that there's two or three units on the property. Um, I'm not sure I can speak to property taxes or if Miss. Yeah. Thank you. Through you to the counselor. Um, in terms of property taxes, it's all one. It's all one ownership. So the property tax, it'll be assessed based on two dwelling units on the property. So the municipal property tax assessment corporation will reevaluate the site based on two two houses on the property versus previously having one. Uh, they their value may increase and and their taxes may increase, but it's just one property tax bill. Uh, there won't be two uh, because again, it's one roll number, one property. Uh, in terms of servicing, again, that's up to the homeowner. They'll contact Hydro or, or whomever. They may have separate, um, you know, in terms of a, a meter reading, uh, three separate meter readings. I don't know about servicing, whether you'd have separate meter readings on that, uh, Mr. Nickel, but I will defer to you Thank on you. servicing. Thank you. Uh, generally, we would prefer to have multiple, um, multiple meters if there's multiple services, so or many services are coming to the street, they would be an equivalent number of meters in the property. Thank you. Thank you. I've got Councillor Thompson, then you Egg, and then Peter Angelo. <laughs> Were you in there? I, I think... Oh, no, he's Thompson. I, <laughs> no, 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 no. I think the... Mind you, he doesn't uh, like him at Halloween. The <laughs> province that permits to... Um, residential in a single and I think three is too much and for parking and how many people could you be in there I, I have a, a situation in my area where um, parking on the lawn and uh, doing, I think this is two is an, enough with the province, and I don't support that. <coughs> okay, thank you. I've got uh, council. Uh, Mr. I don't know. Do we need to? Do you want to? So um, we can ask. Um, Ms. Foley, so Councillor Thompson lives in, uh, are they considered townhouses? Uh, Councillor Thompson, where do you live? Are they condo, townhouses? What, what, do you, what do you call them where you live? What do they call them? No, it's a single. <coughs> and there's four or five people uh, with cars. Does that answer your question? Yes, <laughs> No, Your Worship, the, the point I was going to make is I do believe that he lives in an attached condominium complex, and I was going to ask through you to the planner whether or not these are, the ADUs are even allowed in those. So. Right, yeah, so through you, Mr. Mayor, thank you, Councillor, for your question. Um, with condominiums, I believe they're they're regulated through their own condo boards and, and things like that, and we've only permitted them in the, the housing typologies. So if someone did want to put in an ADU in a condominium, I believe they'd have to get permission from that condo board. Sound good? Okay, good. Everyone's in agreement? Okay, does that help you? Well, I was only asking He appreciates it. Thank you. <laughs> Councilor Newesteg? Uh, she's trying to Oh. No, no, no. Now, now, yeah, don't argue. Yeah, Okay, Councillor Strange. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, and thank you, Ms. Foley. Uh, you're doing a great job, by the way. Amazing. <laughs> um, I just want to say how happy I, I'm, I'm, I am to, to see this. It, you know, especially nowadays, you know, with the kids, the children aren't being able to afford houses right now, especially with, with mortgage rates and stuff going up. It's, it's crazy, and, and the families are struggling. I think this is a good way, of, you know, in-laws, they can actually house them. I'm sorry? 
<laughs> um, but you can have your kids move into the principal house, and then when you put your additional unit, the, the parents can go in there. It's a way that you, we can save quite a bit of money. I, I just think it's a great report, and, and uh, when uh, the meeting is over, I, I, I move it. Great, thank you. Councilor Newstay. Thank you for your report, very informative. Um, a couple questions. Public notice, whenever we even put on a garage or anything else, we have to have a public notice. Is this the same that a public notice has to be posted and made aware to the neighbors that um, there's a unit being built in the back? Uh, through you, Mr. Mayor, to the councillor. Sorry, I, I don't believe so, as it's not going through a planning approval process. It would just be a building permit, um, so there wouldn't be any, yeah. And if I can just elaborate, there will still be the building permit notice saying yeah. a, a, a unit's being constructed, whether it's being constructed inside the dwelling or outside the dwelling, you'll still see the notice of a building permit. You just won't have a planning notice um, that you would see for minor variances, <coughs> committee of adjustments, things okay, like that. But something has to be posted. <laughs> Secondly, anything that in terms of aesthetics as well, so are there any, law, any bylaws that are going to address the look of it? Thank you, Councillor. Uh, it's a good question. Right now, no. The Planning Act allows three as of right, so there is no regulations on, on aesthetics, anything like that. What we are looking at is, is what we call a backyard house design. Um, so we are looking at that, and that will be coming forward to Council uh, shortly in terms of we're going to hire a consultant to look at that, some backyard house designs, so that we encourage residents to pick one of the designs we've, we've created or the architects created, and that design uh, then they would go straight to building permits. It's already been pre-approved, those kinds of things. That's how we can control aesthetics um, if on certain ones. Some may just want to build uh, what they want to build and we have no control over aesthetics. Should that not be something we should consider because it, I appreciate having the extra um, homes in the back or extra units, I should say, um, for the affordable housing. That makes a lot of sense, but if we to actually make it negative by putting something that looks um, not sightly in the backyard, um, then we might, we're, we're creating another problem. Could we not have that kind of done ahead of time where these are your designs and make them affordable, like find out ways that we can really have affordable um, units for them so they can pick, it looks, ple it looks nice and a lot of that extra work is done. Thank you, Councillor. Yes, uh, again, we because it goes straight to building permits permitted as of right through provincial legislation, we don't have any control, site plan control or other things. Uh, it goes right to building permit. If they pick one of our designs, obviously, hopefully they're aesthetically a pleasing for, for, for council when they see them, uh, but that's not something we can dictate uh, because building, the, the Building Code Act, you, you come in, uh, apply for a permit, you have 10 days to turn it around. There's nothing on aesthetics or anything else. It's just based on building construction. I just see a potential future problem if people aren't, if, if it's mm -hmm. unsightly that people will be, um, there will be a lot more complaints, so it'll end up working. I, I just see a, a problem and if we can just a, a get out ahead of time with something harmonious for everyone to work together. Anyway, just saying that part. No, and if I may, just quickly, like we will have an uh, an ADU uh, guideline document that we're creating. Uh, development staff are working on that, so we will have some, you know, general steps. We can't force them, but we will provide some guidance uh, on that. Um, but we can't force them. But definitely, we can include that if if that's council's will. But it should. And one, another question: property taxes. I, I forget who mentioned it. They didn't think that it would be an increase. I don't understand how that wouldn't increase. Um, their property taxes because we should be getting getting more revenue from um, additional dwelling. Is that uh, so? I apologize if it sounded I said that it wouldn't increase. Oh. It would increase because oh, it would be I two. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> sorry. And I talk quietly sometimes, okay. so it would be two dwellings on a property. So uh, the impact association or corporation would assess it based on two dwellings rather than one. Thank you. Right. And one last question, just a <coughs> clarification question: What is the maximum um, space that you can use? Like, um, to build an ADU or to put one in. Sorry, for the interior or exterior? No, the exterior. What is the maximum? Like, how are you getting the calculation for the square footage? The uh, size? <laughs> yeah, so for, I, sorry, through you, Mr. Mayor, to the councillor, thank you for your question. Um, so for an ADU and an accessory building, I just yes. want to clarify, yeah. So uh, 
your maximum lot coverage would be the 93 square meters, which includes the existing dwelling. Um, so that would play a role in that. And then, I don't know if you had anything else to add. Yeah. Right. Yeah. <coughs> yeah. Right. So yeah, the, the maximum lot coverage would determine the size of that ADU, awesome. which is where the, the 93 square meters comes so in. Ba so just clarification. Sorry, so yeah. you take a lot. Yes. And how do you determine um, the, the, the maximum, maximum amount? Right. Yes. Yeah. So it would be the square meter of, of, existing of the existing house. dwelling um, subtracted and okay. then. So it's 93. Including yeah. that, including that. Okay. existing dwelling, yes. Very good, sorry. Yeah. I just wanted no, no, thank you for your question. And I think that's everything. Thank you very much. Perfect. Thanks. Yeah, square meters throws me off too, right? I just know square feet. So I went to say square thousand. footage and I had to catch oh, okay. myself, so I apologize. Yeah. Uh, Councillor Peter Angelo? Well, we, we already got to Councillor uh, Thanks. By the way, I think uh, 93 square meters is 1,000 square feet. So that's what it equates to. Okay, that just helps. To thank you for that. Yeah. Um, Off teacher. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, and you worship my question uh, through you to Danielle. Um, well, just in regards to duplexes, um, I see that we're adding it as of right in duplexes. Um, is that something that Bill 23 um, required us to do, or is that something that we decided to do? Right, so through you, Mr. Mayor, thank you for your question, Councillor. Uh, we had a lot of internal discussions as staff about uh, to, whether to include duplexes or not. And after going through it, we debated that uh, a, de a single detached dwelling would be permitted to have three units on that lot. And that could either be two units in inside and one uh, in the exterior. So when considering duplexes, we almost found that it was to the same effect where you could have that house with two units interior and they should be able to add uh, an ADU either in the exterior, in, in an accessory building, or in the interior, where it kind of just was, the duplex was essentially a single detached that already had an ADU, was what we decided as staff. So we allowed to permit it. Oh, sorry, outside of Bill 23. It wasn't required under Bill 23. Yeah. Okay. I didn't think it was, and I'm not opposed to it, but this is the just perhaps one area where I'd like to keep an eye on, just, to, just because duplexes in Niagara Falls you need 60, uh, 60 feet in order to uh, get approval for a duplex. Um, so that means that your uh, one half of it is on 30 feet. Um, so you're now putting three units on 30 feet. Uh, as of right, that's what you're doing. You can either put three in the single building that gets built, or you can put two in the building and then one in behind the building. So um, we're going to keep track of them through our housing strategy, is that correct? Yes, yeah, sorry, and I just want to clarify, Councillor. Yeah. Uh, a duplex is uh, basically a unit that has a, their, yeah, it's okay. split horizontally, so, so not a, a semi detached, okay. but right. again, a, a, a semi would be permitted the three on a lot, so we, we are going to keep track of it through our housing monitoring. Okay, all right. Excellent. Yes, Councillor Coco. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Just on that about the duplex, so if um, the setbacks don't allow. Um, an ADU, because it's a really small uh, backyard, they're not going to get it even though it's a duplex, right? Uh, correct, they could come in for a minor variance, but again, that would be up to the committee. It wouldn't be as of right. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? Yes, Councilor Patel. Through you, Mr. Mayor, to Ms. Foley, or maybe Mr. Nichols. For example, if the 25% of people out of the 300 houses subdivision puts the ADU in the backyard, would the infrastructure support it, especially in the older neighborhood? Yeah, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, it's a good question. So new subdivisions, um, and actually any time a subdivision is developed, we expect a certain amount of runoff to be captured by green space. So by creating hardscaping over top of that green space, now we've actually increased the amount of runoff that's going to our stormwater systems. Um, so that, that plus the impacts of climate change make it a little bit more challenging for us to manage those. However, um, through the building permit process and the submissions of proper drawings for these type of applications, we'll have an opportunity to see what that impact will be on each and every application. Um, I'm not too worried about the, the impact of um, water supply, because a lot of times these are built up neighborhoods that were built before low flow fixtures, and so there's some extra capacity in the system that we didn't have before. So generally we see our supply demands go down. And on sewage generation, it's, um, it's generally not an issue for residential sewage. We see that mostly with wet weather impacts, which are prevalent regardless of uh, 
uh, a few minor uh, additions of those properties. Thanks. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? That's it? You guys sure? You don't want to ask a couple more? <laughs> I feel bad for her. She's going to change her degree. She's in the hot seat now. She's new. She's doing a great job. It's like short game. She's doing a great job. Oh, yeah. If you can deal with this council, you can do it anywhere. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, no. We want her in house. She's, she's a good one. All right. Council, we hear from anyone other than the applicant who wishes to speak to the proposed amendment. Is there anyone here other than the applicant? who wishes to speak to this. Okay, seeing none, well, why am I saying applicant? <laughs> from the applicant? Okay, so I don't need to read that one, do I? Okay. Is there any final questions of counsel as the applicant? Okay, seeing none, the public meeting with respect to the proposed official plan and zoning bylaw amendment is now, conclu is now concluded. What's the will of council? Councilor recommendations. recommendations moved by Councilor Strange, seconded by Councilor Peter Angelo. If there's no further discussion, we'll call the vote. All those in favor? All right, that's approved. Congratulations, great job, yeah. Miss Foley. I got a question: How does council think that Danielle did? Yeah. Hey, let's do it. Great job. Well, well done. Well done. Well, it depends. Yeah, and I, I apologize that one of our counselors' phone kept ringing, and, and it's uh, testing me really well. Well, we wanted to make sure you could deal with distractions, and you did a really good job. Oh, thank you. And Councillor Peter Angel whispers like a like a diesel engine. When he listens, so I can't even hear. I don't know how you concentrated. That was awesome. We can always take her out the region. Yeah. Oh no, she's staying uh, here. She's not going to the region. Okay, yeah. <laughs> Sergeant at Arms, can you remove uh, Councillor Coco, please? <laughs> or, no, not the Coco, Morocco. <laughs> See, it's one of those nights. So we're done with that, right? Okay. It's hot in here, right? It is hot in here. Holy smokes. All right. Yeah, no, it's turned off. They've uh, disconnected the air. We can't do it. We have a brand new system that doesn't work. So I don't know what to do. Talk to the CAO. All right, moving along. We are deputations and presentations. Um, Mr. Uh, Mr. Clerk, can you uh, bring us through these, please? Sure, the first one is a deputation, uh, or sorry, a presentation regarding the development charges study. And we have with us uh, Jackie Hall. She's a project manager from Hemson Consulting, and she'll be leading council through that presentation. Council Morocco, I was only kidding. You didn't have to leave. <laughs> now, Ms. Hall, I, I, I apologize in advance. If there's any distractions, uh, I can't control these people. It's no problem at all. And it is hot in here. It is hot. I right? will say that. Yeah, yeah it is. Here. This over here. <laughs> Great. Am I it's okay all yours. Start? Floor is yours. Wonderful. Yeah, thank you, thank you so much, Welcome. Mr. Mayor, and good evening, members of council. It's a pleasure to be before you today. Um, I'm going to try to be short and sweet because I'm sure this might be a painful topic for those for some people in the room, myself included. I'm kidding. It's it's a it's a good topic, but it is a challenging one for sure. So tonight I'm going to be chatting about the city's uh, development charges background study. Uh, Hemson Consulting has been retained to update the city's uh, DC background study in advance of the expiry. We've also been retained to also do a refresh of the community benefits strategy. Today, what I'm going to do over the next 10 minutes or so is chat a little bit about what we've done in the past for the city, what are development charges, what are the growth funding tools that are available to the city. Uh, the recent legislative changes, I know Bill 23 has been mentioned this evening. I'll talk a little bit about that and some curveballs we also received yesterday from the province as well. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about what the city funds through development charges currently, uh, some policy items as well as the role of council in this study process, and we'll wrap up the discussion with some next steps. So as I mentioned, we've been retained uh, by uh, the city in order to undertake a new background study. Um, the city's current bylaw will expire in July 2024, so we have to have a new bylaw in place in advance of that expiry or else you can't collect development charges. 
there was a CBC bylaw that was brought before council in 2022. It was approved and adopted. Uh, there is no expiry on that bylaw. However, the legislation does require us to do a refresh. It makes a lot of sense to do it at the same time as a DEC background study, since the projects go hand in hand together. So we'll be doing that in tandem with this. It doesn't necessarily mean that we might adopt a new bylaw. It might simply mean that we pass a motion saying that we've reviewed, everything's great. We're gonna keep on with the current bylaw in place. So what are development charges? I'm sure everyone's fairly familiar with them, but I'll do a little bit of 101. Uh, they are fees imposed on new development in order to finance what we call growth-related capital costs. So as the city grows, we have to build roads, we have to pay for sewer and water infrastructure, residents need libraries, we have to have access to parks. The principle of development charges is that growth is going to pay for growth, so that the existing taxpayers aren't um, uh, un, uh, inappropriately burdened by these additional costs. The, the whole rationale is that new development should pay for these things. We have a bit of a new framework uh, in Ontario right now in terms of how we're funding growth-related infrastructure. And it's a little bit uh, challenging at times to navigate because there is a lot going on and there's a lot of different things that have changed in recent years. So development charges are a primary revenue uh, source for municipalities. It's used to fund the initial round of capital infrastructure. We have a very detailed prescribed list of services which we can and cannot fund. Uh, certain services have been removed recently, so things like studies uh, that's come out parking is no longer eligible affordable housing interestingly enough is also out uh, but there's now exemptions for affordable housing which we'll chat about in a little bit we used to have to have a we used to uh, have a 10 percent discount on certain services that has since been removed cbc's are a n relatively new tool that municipalities can use except for i would say that it's it's quite limited in comparison to development charges so Similar to DCs, it can fund uh, growth-related capital expenditures. Um, In-kind contributions are permitted. However, uh, the nature in which they are levied and charged is extremely limited. So we can only charge up to 4% of the land value, and it's limited on development with five or um, more stories in 10 or more residential units, and only local municipalities can charge. Parkland acquisition is another important tool. Um, it's uh, charged at a standard rate of 5% for residential, 2% for non-residential. There are alternative higher rates that can apply. Um, however, they're capped by the legislation and they're done on a, a unit per hectare basis. And cash and lieu payments are permitted if you're unable to dedicate land. All of these tools are available to the tribunal, so the OLT, uh, with certain conditions. A bit on the recent legislative changes. So there are some new exemptions that will be brought forward as part of this update, some of which are already in force right now. So if you were to go to the counter, some of these are um, actually already applicable. So the biggest item is uh, the affordable attainable housing. So there are exemptions proposed uh, for both of these types of housing. However, they're not yet in force. Um, we don't have a definition. The province has recently announced um, some additional details on how affordable will be defined through Bill 134. However, we don't know the thresholds that will be associated with it. So right now, there's still uncertainty about what those exemptions will look like and what the impact will be on municipal revenues, but we're continuing to monitor that closely through the study process. There's also exemptions for additional units within existing uh, residential housing and also existing rental housing as well. So the conversation on ADUs, many of those units would be exempt from the payment of development charges. Uh, Nonprofit housing, which is defined by the legislation, is exempt. Inclusionary zoning units are also proposed to be exempt, but they have to be defined as affordable. So that policy is not really enforced yet until we have that definition of affordable brought through the legislation. Uh, one of the other new discounts we have in place is for rental housing developments, which are defined as four or more units. Uh, there's discounts based on the number of bedrooms. So if you have three or more bedrooms, it's a 25% discount. Two or more, 15, uh, 20, uh, my apologies, and one bedroom or less is a 15% discount. One of the most significant changes is that the fully calculated rates now must be phased in over five years. So you can see the box on the right-hand side of the presentation. In year one, we can only charge 80% of what we calculate. Year two, 85, and we phase in over five years till we get to 100%. That, what we're seeing for most of our clients, is about 10% of the DC revenue that you otherwise would have been able to collect. So it's not inconsequential. 
So what do DCs currently fund in Niagara Falls? Uh, if you were to come to the counter today and you were building in the urban area of the, of the city, you'd pay about $17,240 for a single and semi-detached. What that rate is uh, made up of is a whole host of different services. We have what we call engineered services, storm, water, sidewalks, roads and related. We also have general services, which include library, fire, parks and recreation, public works, and also transit, which we know now has been uploaded to the region and is falling off. The rates also differ, differ by units to reflect the different occupancies. So an apartment would pay less than a single detached. Non-residential development charges, uh, they're levied within different areas of the city. We have the urban area, non-urban area, and also the core tourist area and the non-core tourist area. The bulk of the rate for the non-residential fees are engineered services, which isn't dissimilar to what we see elsewhere. Things like library and parks and recreation are not charged for the, are not levied against non-residential development. Uh, for the study process, we'll be going through um, a whole host of different um, uh, analyses, we'll be looking at the growth forecast, we'll be taking into account any sort of changes that came out of the urban land areas and the announcements from the province yesterday, recognizing that there's going to be a winding back of some of the official plan changes uh, at uh, the region level. We'll look at the capital programs with staff for developing the historic service levels. And then we also have to come up with our capital programs and identify any sort of discounts, uh, grants, exemptions, um, and reduce those from the program. Once we have that, we'll split the cost between the residential and non-residential sectors, which will levy for residential rates on a per unit basis and non-residential based on a per square meter of gross floor area. What council needs to do as part of this process is consider and adopt the capital programs that will bring forward for each of those services. So we'll identify the projects, the shares of the projects that will be funded from development charges, shares of projects that will not, the timelines, uh, the area and the scope. Um, there's also a requirement to consider area rating, which is whether or not we should levy development charges on a citywide basis or an area specific basis, which the city already does in their current bylaw, which we, which we will be reviewing. We are required to have at least one public meeting. Uh, council can make a determination as to whether or not another one is required. Um, oftentimes we engage with the development industry earlier on in that study process, which oftentimes uh, means one is more than enough, but if there is a need to do that, uh, that can certainly be done. And council will be asked to consider the implementation of the DC bylaw within the context of the legislation and other municipal objectives. So whether or not you should implement the full or partial rates, recognizing that we are now subject to a phase in, so you can choose to discount them further. Uh, you can also delay the effective date of the bylaw. You can also add additional exemptions over what the province currently requires. And you also have to, of course, approve the bylaws themselves. Uh, as part of this review, we're going to be doing a deep dive into the city's existing bylaw, including the current definitions, making sure that they're cleaned up and they align with uh, what we're seeing in terms of built form. On the slide here is a review of your current, what we call the non-statutory exemptions. So these are exemptions that aren't required by the legislation. A few of them are fairly standard. Agricultural uses and cemeteries are often exempt in other municipalities. Everything else on the list is not so common. Most municipalities now are starting to strip out the exemptions, recognizing that there are um, some uh, severe fiscal consequences to the new Bill 23 changes. But some of these will have minor impacts. But certainly things that we'll be looking at is the exemption for the industrial land uses, um, whether or not the charitable institutions are picked up already in the statutory exemptions of the legislation. Um, the affordable housing projects, recognizing that those will already be provided with exemptions through the legislation. There's also the designated exemption areas, which is 75% of the DCs for the community improvement plans. So whether or not we continue with that in this bylaw or we perhaps put them in the CIP bylaw, we'll be having discussions with staff in terms of what makes the most sense for the city and what protects the city from a fiscal uh, perspective. Uh, there's also rules with respect to redevelopment. So if you demo a single detached house and you build a condo, what are you going to get in terms of um, a, a, a redevelopment credit for that existing lot? And then there's also something called the local service guidelines, which helps staff to determine what is a direct developer responsibility. So they are often responsible for infrastructure internal to a subdivision, roads, sidewalks. 
this uh, guideline helps provide clarity in terms of what a developer is responsible for and what can be included in the DC study. In terms of passing the bylaw, what we're going to be doing over the next several months is putting together a background study. It has to be released 60 days in advance of the uh, bylaw passage. We're going to be advertising for the public meeting, which requires a 20 days notice. Uh, the bylaw has to be released at least two weeks before the public meeting. Um, ideally, we do it at the time of the background study, but there can be a bit of a lag there. We're going to hold our public meeting, receive submissions from the public and uh, questions of council. Uh, we'll be passing the bylaw and then we go through our appeal period. In terms of the study timeline, uh, really right now it, we're working on developing the critical inputs to the calculation and the DC background study itself. So the capital programs are being um, drafted. We're working closely with staff on the new transportation master plan and infrastructure master plan, making sure those costs are considered as part of this work. Uh, we're obviously meeting with yourselves today just to give a bit of a primer into what we're doing. Um, and then we'll be working over the next couple months. Really, uh, in advance of that uh, bylaw expiry in July, we'd like to pass a bylaw in late May, early June. So just making sure that we have a little bit of buffer there if we have to do anything else leading before the expiry. And then um, essentially by the summer, the appeal period would be done. And then hopefully if there's no appeal, we'll just continue on with the, with the bylaw. So I know I breezed through that very quickly, but I'll pause for questions or comments. Thank you very much. Any questions? Thank you very much. Uh, any questions from Ms. Hall? Councilor Peter Angelo. Yeah, thanks, Your Worship. I do have a question uh, through you to Ms. Hall. Uh, thanks for your presentation. I know you talked about area ratings in the presentation. Are you specifically referencing the CTA that we have right now? Yeah. Are, are, are you looking at coming back with any type of different recommendation? Is that something that you're talking to staff about? Yes, through you, Mr. Mayor. Um, that's certainly an area of the bylaw that we are examining, specifically with the new um, infrastructure master plan and transportation master plan costs um, being brought forward. We want to make sure that the benefiting area still makes sense. So if we determine that the benefiting area for the infrastructure is larger than the core tourist area, uh, then that boundary could be redefined uh, through this process. Okay, and I, I guess I just want to mention, Your Worship, because Ms. Hall doesn't look like she's clearly not old enough, um, but way back when this issue first came to Council, uh, it came here because of the fact that, you know, the residents were the ones that didn't really want to pay for the overinflated development uh, that was happening in the core tourist area. So what Council, and council and staff decided to do was set up the core tourist area as a separate development charge. And that was back when, uh, I believe, the casino was being built and there was a lot of development there. So it was the residents that really saw, you know, parts of the development charges that they paid for uh, going to the core, core tourist area. They didn't want to do it. I don't know that it would be, um, uh, I, I guess, uh, the way forward to reverse that now um, because they paid all their own development charges. So uh, is it something that you would open up to public meetings, contact them about, uh, if that was a consideration? Uh, yes, through you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, absolutely. So the, the legislation does require us to go through the public consultation process. The background study will set out any changes that we're recommending and why. Um, and so there will be opportunity to make comment on it through that process. We'll also be meeting with the development industry uh, in the next couple of weeks as well, just to give them an introduction to the study process and then meet with them in addition to the public meeting. So they're under, they're aware of the changes that we're proposing. I will also note as well that any change we do propose will be revenue neutral to the city, so you'll still be able to collect the same amount of revenue hypothetically. It just might look a little bit different for the different payers. So whether or not we structure the charge uh, between the residential, non-residential, or if it's just on the non-residential um, uh, development, which is how it's currently structured, we'll make sure that that happens. I understand. Okay, thanks, Your Worship. Great. Any other questions? Yes, Councillor Patel. Uh, move Who are you, Mr. Mayor? Or, 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 are we following some certain yeah. model? Yeah. To oh, come not yet. We're not there. Councillor Patel has got it first. I'll come back to you. Who are you, Mr. Mayor? Is there any specific model we are following, or we are, or is there an example that some other municipality has implemented this? 
Yes, through you, Mr. Mayor. It's a great question. So the, in, here in Ontario, we have the most prescribed process for calculating what I'll refer to as development charges. So the schematic on the screen here is all the different requirements that the legislation says we have to do. So there is essentially one model that every municipality goes through in order to arrive at the charges. There's some slight differences in the methodology depending on what the municipality you're working within um, needs in terms of growth and development and capital infrastructure. But this is by and large what we followed for the city in terms of the last background study update subject to some of the more recent legislative changes. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions of council? Okay, seeing none, uh, looking for a motion to receive. Is that no. right, uh, Mr. Clark? Yeah. yeah. To receive, yeah, Councilor Thompson. It's gotta come back, yeah. Yep, sure. to receive the, the, the report yes. or the presentation. Yeah. Yep, a second by Councillor Patel. Uh, we'll call the vote, all those in favor? Okay, that's great, nice job, great. thanks very much. Okay, moving along here. So we're gonna call up Dale Morton, our Director of Communications, and she's gonna provide Council with a summary of our strategic plan for 2023-2027. She's gonna do it from there. I, I'm gonna do it okay. from here, yep. thank All you. Good. Um, good evening, Mayor and Council. Uh, you will have received a detailed strategic plan PowerPoint in your package. And as this is Council's, it's truly Council's plan um, for the term, I recognize that you're familiar with the strategies within the plan. And I'm happy to provide a high level presentation at this time. Um, or uh, staff can take comments or questions um, that you might have on the plan. Uh, any questions of Council? Yes, Councillor Peter Angel. Thanks, Your Worship. I don't have any questions of Ms. Martin. I mean, I like the plan as it is. I, I do have some questions, though, of staff in terms of just what some of the um, uh, what some of the bullets are actually defining, um, if that's okay. Yeah. Yeah. So, did you? How long was the uh, the overview you were talking about? Was it like uh, probably fifteen minutes or so, and then questions mm -hmm. after that. So. <laughs> yes. Yeah. 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 Got it. Okay, we well, why don't we data. follow along right now, Councillor Peter Angel's way of thinking? We'll get some answers to those bullets. Yeah, and I'm happy to do away with the presentation. I noticed though it didn't come up on our agenda, so I don't know whether or not the public can actually see the presentation that you have. If not, maybe you can just upload it after, unless I just didn't refresh mine. Um, uh, through you, um, Mayor. Um, yes, it was added to the agenda. Okay, good. It just was a refreshment. Okay. Uh, in, in that case, Your Worship, I don't have any questions of Ms. Morton. I'm happy to move it if you want, um, but then I do have some questions of staff. Okay. Okay. So you've got a motion by Councillor Peter Angelo. Do you have a second? Do you second it, Councillor Lepo? I'll second it, and I have some questions okay. of staff. Too. Go ahead. So, d uh, to, to staff or just to the no to staff but councillor peter angelo had them first so i'll go ahead after him okay oh great okay <laughs> thanks your worship um yeah i guess uh under the heading of environmental sustainability your worship um uh this year i thought was supposed to be the year that we were starting an urban forest strategy i know that we put um funds in the budget uh to start this process so I guess I was just wondering if I can get an update from staff in terms of where we are with that and how it's moving along. Yeah, thank you through you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I, I too would have liked to be a little bit further along with our urban forest management strategy counselor. We had a busy year in our parks department with delivering some capital projects. Uh, what we have done is um, there is a $100,000 allocation in this year's budget, I believe, and we haven't spent any of it, but we've been, uh, we had a summer student work through an updated tree inventory for um, uh, our street tree inventory and our parks inventory, so areas where we haven't been inventorying in the past, so we have a better database to start with. And our, our park student has also done some work to develop um, a list of best practices in other jurisdictions and how they've implemented a for forest management uh, plan. So we're still hoping to uh, put a procurement together to bring on uh, third party assistance to help move us forward on that plan and it might take a little bit of extra funds in the 2024 budget as well. But we're still eager to move it forward and we know that um, there are some initiatives that align with our planning team on um, some development related uh, plantings that um, council had even asked for uh, a strategy on how to, how to work with developers on some planting. So we wanna make sure that our forest management plan and our uh, planning policies will match up uh, when the, the time comes. Thank you. Okay. Um, Thanks, Your Worship. I guess just to follow up with that, so uh, it's good news, I guess, that we're looking at putting out an RFP. Um, I hope we can put it out sooner rather than later. That just means that 
you know, we're going to get the ball rolling sooner. Um, is it contingent on funding for 2024 in the budget? Or is the 100000 that we put in there enough to, to get us started? And through you, Mr. Mayor, um, we can definitely get a great start with the funds we have available. I, I'm always in favor of phasing projects so that right. we can um, get through a phase and understand the project better before we move on to next phasing. So we hope to, uh, to kick that off as soon as we can uh, get some of our staff back, staff back off their capital, uh, big capital project season this summer. Uh, okay. And, and would the capital be like the asset management plan? That's the one that falls under the critical infrastructure, I guess. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, through Mr. Mayor, I was referring to some of the projects we had, like our tennis and basketball program and the um, the Children's Memorial Park. We, a lot of our resources were were busy building those capital projects this year, so we just didn't have those resources to move forward with the forest management plan. Okay. Um, all right, Your Worship. I'll move on. The other question I had was just uh, I know there's a bullet up there in in regards to reducing the impact of wet weather. Uh, situations that we have here in the city. Uh, I, I know for a long time I've talked about, you know, increasing the size of the uh, of the main drains that we have, so that they can hold more water. So that when we have these larger storms, you know, the water doesn't always back up. Um, I was just wondering what staff's uh, interpretation of how they would reduce the impact of wet weather storms. That's all. I mean, I like it as as a, as a strategy to have. But I'm wondering how we're going to get there. Yeah, through you, Mr. Mayor, um, I'm, I'm happy that you asked the question, Councillor. Um, I would argue that at, um, removing wet weather from our sewer system is one of our highest budget priorities. We spend a lot of money on sewer separation and building new sewers so that they're, um, they don't allow infiltration. So um, one of the significant initiatives we have underway right now is a, a, a water wastewater master servicing plan and stormwater. And it, it also has a wet weather uh, strategy component with it. So we're taking that um, top-down view of our, our entire system, understanding where we have significant areas of wet weather and how we can put uh, future budgets and future plans in place to, to address those. Prevention is the best, so um, upstream of, of the outlet of the pipe is always the best place to prevent um, that infiltration from entering into the system. So we want to take that approach as our first priority uh, by separating sewers so that that infl inflow doesn't enter into our system. Uh, but we need a game plan, we need a financing plan, and we need to know where to start and how to leverage some funding from both the region and other upper tier levels of government. That in itself is going to accomplish two things. It's going to reduce the amount of pollution that we, we discharge to the environment um, uh, through overflows, sewer overflows, and it's going to prevent instances of basement flooding. So those are some pretty significant impacts that um, are driving these initiatives. But we need that master strategy so that we can break it down into actual implementable projects um, that will have a realistic um, and, and a real and measurable impact on um, the reduction of that wet weather. Another major initiative in and of itself is the region's wastewater treatment plant. Um, when the current treatment plant can't keep up with flows heading to it and its pumping stations can't uh, handle the capacity that's coming in those major wet weather events, um, there are overflows that happen and there's basin backups that happen. So, that is something that we'll continue to partner with Niagara Region on to make sure that it's uh, it's a high priority for them and that it's implemented in as quick a timeline as they can accomplish. Okay. Um, thanks, Your Worship. And just to follow up, uh, I know sewer separation, we do it every single year. Would you have a ballpark of perhaps where we are in terms of separated, not separated, 60-40? Yeah, through you, Mr. Mr. Mayor. Um, we I'll have a better idea when our strategy is completed. Uh, we have about, uh, I'm not going to get the number right, maybe 10% of our system is still a combined sewer system. Um, but sometimes it's combined in one location and not combined in another location. So um, what I mean by that is the, um, you know, the downstream end might be combined, but the upstream end isn't combined, but we consider the whole system combined. So um, what, as we work through our master servicing plan, we'll have a bit better information on specifically how much um, of our system needs to be separated. I just don't have those numbers for you today. Okay. All right. Uh, thanks, Your Worship. Moving on, under um, social sustainability, uh, talks about an affordable rental uh, CIP, an affordable rental housing CIP. I know I had floated this idea uh, about a year and a half ago. Uh, I'm happy to see that it's part of our strategy now. I, I just want to know what um, 
again, what staff has in mind, what their CIP uh, looks like, Your Worship. Oh, sorry. Another one, Ms. Dolch. Oh, Ms. okay. Ms. Dolch. All right. Ms. Dolch. <laughs> Okay, I mean, in the previous council I was at, if I had to ask to repeat the question, I had to buy everybody donuts, so I'm gonna have to do that again. <laughs> <laughs> what? That's okay, I don't, I, need oh. I don't need a donut. I don't need a donut. I could start. I was just wondering, like, uh, like staff have on it on there as part of our strategy to have an affordable housing CIP. Um, I was wondering from staff's opinion, what does that look like? Because I know what CIPs are in other areas and what they look like, but I don't know what the affordable housing one looks like. Thank you, uh, Your Worship, through to the Councillor, uh, and I apologize for that. Cruel. In, in terms of the affordable <laughs> rental housing CIP, we, um, we've put some thought to it. We, we don't have a full picture of it yet, obviously, uh, but some of the things we're looking at is the, the backyard house designs and the servicing might be something that we would tie to affordable housing. Uh, there might be a commitment for three to five years, that kind of thing, if you do get the, the funding from us. Um, so those are some of the things. Right now, all the DCs and those things would qualify for under if they were affordable would qualify those exemptions would already be in place so there's not much there to to further exempt um, so we are looking at some of those things we're also looking at some funding uh, that we've put forward to the federal government if we do receive something like that we will be looking at other incentive programs because there'll be more funding available uh, larger funding this point uh, but right now we we are we are reviewing the CIP program in its totality and we will be bringing forward something on affordable rental housing CIP as well okay thanks and uh, the last point I'm going to mention your worship is just under the economic diversification uh, it's great to see that the number one bullet there is acquiring lands uh, for industrial purposes uh, these were lands that the city would own and that the city would control and this would help us to attract businesses I've said it a number of times, it's very hard to attract businesses when uh, the lands that are industrial are owned by private people. Uh, when it's owned by the city, uh, it's, it's much easier to attract because they want to come, you're able to negotiate a fair price, uh, but when you leave it in private hands, it's very difficult to attract. So I think that definitely is going to be one of our number one priorities this term. Agreed. You sure you don't have any more questions? Or? No more questions, Your Worship. No? Uh, okay. Uh, apple fritter. Yeah, cooler. I think everyone put the right. orders in. Uh, Councilor Coco. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you to staff for putting this together. I had a couple of questions. Um, under the budget, I was wondering, will we continue to um, work towards participatory budgeting? I know we've done a little bit in the last couple of years. Um, usually participatory budgeting is uh, more expansive. Will we be doing any more? Maybe that's to the CAO. I'll say something, and uh, Ms. Clark may uh, want to hit me in the back of the head. Uh, yeah, participatory budgeting, I think we are piloting some of the initiatives uh, uh, for that in the rec and culture plan. Uh, you know, the challenge that we have with the finance department is we are still trying to catch up uh, in the finance department, and we are launching, uh, uh, going to be launching a new ERP system. So. That one is kind of resource constrained uh, to some extent. So we'll, we'll monitor how the uh, first round went and see what the resources are because it is much more resource intense uh, for that other than just having your normal input and consultation that we do for the budget. I will say this though, like <clears throat> from a few years ago to today, we have done far more reach out in our budgets and we have far more public input into our budgets than uh, just a few years ago so it is a bit of a uh, you know it, it, you know are we exactly where we want to be no but we're, we're making pretty good progress uh, going forward so uh, I think that one's going to be difficult for us because of our constraints on, on uh, staff time okay thank you um, on the environmental sustainability it talks about the climate adaptation plan and the urban forest management plan um, and creating a new woodland restoration, restoration and preservation policies. I, I think we're doing a good job. We have a good idea of where we want to go, but I'm going to go back to the preservation. It's great to plant trees, but we really need to see, save the trees that we have, and that's the preservation part of it. Uh, whether that's a, a private tree bylaw or other things, we really need to save what we have and um, not let the trees be cut down for development. 
Uh, that was just a statement, no a question. Um, under social s sustainability, we mention youth, but there's no mention about um, seniors and it's the fastest growing population. Now I know some of the things, um, the actions do support seniors, like with housing and that sort of thing. I was wondering, do we need um, maybe a separate point for specifically seniors? Seniors? Yeah, thank you. Um, you know, through it, I, not to over-segmentize it, we do have a fair, uh, fairly strong seniors, or older adult programming that we undertake uh, in the municipality and that's a far more mature program than some of the other programming that we have uh, that uh, especially with youth retention and that segment of uh, kind of uh, you know other youth programming than just the some of the physical uh, stuff that we do so um, you know it wasn't when we look at our strategic pillars and where we need to focus some of the new resources on, uh, that wasn't one of them that we were uh, focused on. Again, we only have so many uh, things we do and, and our uh, older adult program is something that we are gradually expanding um, on and we are gradually uh, managing, but it, it's a much more mature program that we have. Uh, they've moved into the uh, McBain Center. We have major renovations going on. We've expanded their services, so we've already done a whole bunch of uh, aspects for uh, for the old, older adult programming. Okay, thank you. I wasn't thinking specifically an older adult or seniors program. It's sort of like diversity and inclusion. Um, you don't just have a committee. Diversity and inclusion should be in all of our committees. Um, when we look at all of our programs, our website, our processes, it should be in tune with what seniors are need, needing, whether that's accessibility issues or, or, or whatever. So it's not just the seniors programs that I'm talking about. It's seen, having a lens from a seniors, um, a seniors lens for everything that we do. Yeah, that's included. Like you have to remember, these are specific actions that we're going to say. Here's something that we're going to do. Uh, the you know social sustainability that has that broader lens. But um, when you pick out youth programming, it's because we have some specific actions that we're going to undertake. Uh, so I don't want it to look like we're not doing anything. And see, there are actions that are being undertaken. But yeah, when we look at building complete communities, uh, that lens is already there. So that's part of the. The pillar, the actions are just really for council to say, here's some of the new things that we're be coming up that you can measure some of the programs for. So anything that we already have in flight or we're doing, we're not highlighting that in the strategic plan. This is more for new things that are coming out. Okay, thank you. Under ec economic diversification, I was wondering if um, um, someone can tell me, what does the University of Niagara Falls support look like and what does the Niagara Falls Innovation Hub look like under economic diversity? Um, so, uh, as far as support for the um, university, uh, it's no different than any other business coming to town. We are uh, supporting them with um, their undertaking the renovations at uh, the Hatch building. Uh, they're trying to plug into the community. Uh, they've already, uh, you know, asked asked to be part of some community measures. So we're aligning them with uh, the community. So to me, that's a good news story as far as them integrating into it. Uh, the Niagara Falls Innovation Hub support, um, that is a, uh, we did submit a, uh, for funding to the federal government. Uh, uh, the federal government funds it on a uh, shared revenue basis. So just like our last program, uh, they match dollars with us. So if we are successful with uh, that application, uh, that support would be for us to continue on with our financial support for the uh, Innovation Hub. Okay, thank you. Um, also under economic diversification, um, I know it's always been, it's been said recently that we're sort of stagnant at the number of visitors coming to Niagara Falls, uh, that we need to, to do new things. Um, I, I know it's come to council before and um, I'm sure it's going to come back in a different way, the Geopark U UNESCO designation. It brings different tourists to our area. When you have more tourists, you have more, more jobs. So there, it, it's sort of a, a cyclical um, thing to look at. Um, so I just wanted to make that. And then um, there was no mention of supporting heritage or preservation. And I'm wondering, um, I know we have our heritage um, committee and we're working on her heritage designation because of Bill 23, there's been some changes. What, what um, other programs do we have for heritage preservation? Um, again, there's already existing programming. So uh, again, for the strategic plan, 
we're only kind of highlighting some of the new stuff that would be moving forward, but Ms. Dolch can certainly answer uh, for the uh, existing heritage programming, uh, you know, that we do have and that we are looking to encourage uh, on some of the uh, secondary plans, or not secondary plans, but some of the uh, uh, site plans that are coming forward, especially in the downtown. Ms. Dolch? Thank you, Worship. Through you to the councillors. So we do have our heritage grant application currently. Uh, we are looking at all our, our grant applications, so we will uh, bring that forward as well once we do the overview of not only CIP grant areas but all grants. Um, it might be something we'll look at in the future. Right now, um, our, our biggest focus is getting those those buildings possibly designated. So uh, we're putting most of our resources at that at this point in time. Okay, thank you. Um, and just one co final comment about the heritage. I know we have those programs for the granting and, and doing that, but I mean us as a council and us as staff for our own um, our own buildings, um, I'd like to see a more extensive plan with, with heritage and preservation with that. So th those are all my comments and questions. Okay, uh, Councillor Newston. Uh, through you, Mr. Mayor. Um, actually, I was going to mention one of the points that Councillor Lococo mentioned was the senior, and to um, our CEO's point that, yes, we do have senior programming, but it would be a good idea to have it there just so that it's, we have such a large community of seniors that we can just keep it as a forefront and a focus. And maybe another idea is that, because all these committees, you can see how we over, or all of them are kind of integrated through all these different plans, is that each committee kind of make it um, a priority to share this plan with um, with all their members so that they can see where the focus is and how it all how we're working together just to keep us all um, going towards the same direction but I would um, support uh, Council Lococo um, point of putting the seniors in under the social sustainability section or just add to it thank you okay, thank you for that <clears throat> do we have any other questions or comments of council Seeing none, uh, maybe we can get a motion to receive. Oh, there is one. Uh, that's right, you made it, didn't you? Mm -hmm. And it was no, seconded by Council of the Coco. I remember. It was about an hour ago, I think, right? Okay, we'll call the vote. All those in favor? Okay, and that's approved. Thank you. Okay, moving on to reports. Uh, item one, annual update of OLG spending and commitments. Uh, recommendation that we receive the report and secondly that we re approve the staff recommendations for key areas of spending. Yeah. Councillor Peter Angelo? Yeah. yeah, Your Worship, I don't want to move in the report and I'll uh, yeah. comment. Oh, can you comment and second it? Uh, I'll Councillor second Coker, you'll second? A okay, you want to comment? I'll get to you, Councillor uh, Thompson. Yeah, thanks, Councilor Your Worship. Peter I was just going to ask under the um, under our social services initiative, uh, I, I, I understand that you know staff are trying to adhere to our um, our core services and so they don't really want the funding to come out of the levy so there's only <coughs> 150,000 of it coming out of the levy 350,000 of it coming out of uh, the casino funds um, so the social services is in a percentage it's a dollar amount that was going to be my question and then you know if council finds that the model that we've chosen isn't working we'll have the ability to go back and relook at what we did. Ms. Clark. Through you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, yeah, at the moment, I just have it marked down as the $350,000 commitment, but quite frankly, it's up to the Willow Council. Um, I think you'll probably guide the decision annually when you set your, your budget, yeah. would be my guess. A percentage is risky because you may not raise enough for what you want to accomplish that year. And do, do, the only other question I wanted to ask you, Worship, is what was the total amount that we gave out last year in terms of the social services? Ms. Clark? Through you, Mr. Mayor. In terms of simply the operating levy amounts that we give to um, its three main organizations, right. the YWCA Project Share and Women's Place, it's about $370,000. Um, but we do, I don't have a number off the top of my head, but we do a lot of other social service initiatives through our capital budget um, that would play a part as well. And, and maybe not for, uh, maybe not for Ms. Clark, but uh, maybe for someone else, Your Worship. This year, when we do look at the social services, are we gonna, um, are we gonna have any core dedicated funding or is it all going to be through uh, an annual application? Because I know that's something that we talked about last year. Um, a lot of these organizations that are 
foundations in our, like in our municipality, they need to know that they have core funding in order to continue. So um, is that something that's gonna be part of the process? Like fee for service, you mean, versus? No, I mean, I guess, uh, you know, part of the worry is that they're gonna have to apply every year and then be notified of whether or not they have any funding that year. Um, whereas last year when they came and they made presentations to council, they talked about, uh, you know, having that core funding. They need to know that they're getting, you know, a certain amount of funds every single year so that they can offer certain programs or continue to offer certain programs. Um, but to do it, uh, you know, maybe you'll get it this year, maybe you won't get it next year. Um, it doesn't really work for them. Mr. CAO. Yeah, thank you through the chair. That was one of the uh, points staff had made with our current funding stream because it is an annual uh, for grabs. Um, you know, whether council wants to do core funding versus multi-year program funding, there is a slight difference between the two because core funding is generally funding that goes to organizations that aren't, or, or goes to an organization and it just goes to their general kind of overhead core and that's how they base their overhead operations on. Multi-year funding uh, for a program is, you know, I'm gonna fund you for five years to run a particular program to get these outcomes. And those are options council uh, will consider and we'll be bringing a report back. I have been meeting with the, uh, uh, with our agencies plus other agencies um, in the region. We've had a couple of uh, meetings um, and we also need to align our funding that we have with, you know, the strategy of, of council uh, and, uh, and move forward that way. So during the budget process, uh, there will be a report specifically on uh, that and uh, we may have some unique opportunities to do some uh, some new stuff uh, with that funding also. Are you sure? Okay. Councillor Coco. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Two points. Um, I, I think along with what Councillor Peter Angelo was <coughs> saying, I was hoping that um, the social funding wasn't being approved through this report. I thought it was going to be coming back later, so we've already confirmed that. Um, and then my second one is regarding the police uh, the casino police funding. Uh, the Victoria Center BIA had a meeting last week and one of the things that they were talking about was police presence, that they felt that police presence would be able to help with the reduction of crime and some of the, the incidences and behaviors. So I guess the question is, um, the casino funding with specific BIAs, how can there be discussions started about what kind of policing could be in these BIAs to help with that? Is there a certain number of hours that is attributed to BIAs? Um, they really felt foot patrols would be better than police going around in, in vehicles. Um, we, we don't know where to start, so does anyone have any ideas? I'd suggest that we bring in our superintendent uh, here of District 2, which is Niagara Falls, and have those discussions. And I agree with you, foot patrols are the best for uh, street level presence, and it gives people a level of comfort, and also on the bicycles. That's another thing, and they have been doing it, but you know, I know it's never enough, it seems, but uh, I don't know, maybe the CAO, did you want to weigh in on uh, part of our uh, agreement with the region? Uh, well, the agreement's specific to the casino core unit, uh, but um, we have had a discussion uh, based upon Councillor Coco's request, I think two sessions ago with regards to a safety committee with, uh, I did have an opportunity to speak with NRP representatives, we're gonna bring them uh, to council uh, for a bit of a presentation uh, on that, on you know general safety concerns and where, uh, what are some of their strategies, so that so that council and the broader public understand uh, what are some of the things that are being done uh, with it. Uh, and you know the police, uh, my experience with the police have been, uh, they have very good uh, data on where issues are and. Though you may perceive that there's some lack of safety in a particular area, sometimes the perception of the data actually doesn't uh, match up, and uh, and some of the perception issues that are out there, um, you know, are uh, you know are, are needs to be addressed in, in other manners. Um, so anyway, so th what I would say is that we are we have invited the police. We're going to coordinate a meeting back, and I think it'd be a good time. Uh, mm -hmm. to address some of those uh, some of those questions and concerns at that point in time when we have the uh, yeah. experts in the room. Okay, that would be great. Um, in general, Pam, from us... Yeah, I'm going to get to you, Councillor. I got you on the list. You're next. You're no, next. 
In, yeah, go ahead, Councillor. In, in, in general, for policing, but specifically for BIAs, like, does the the amount that we're paying to the police is there a specific geographical area around the casino that they would cover? And if they yes. do, um, you know, can we have certain schedules and include the BIAs on that? So it's you know, policing in general, and then for BIAs as well for the casino part yeah. of it. So yeah. it is a geographic district. Yeah. yeah. So um, if we can get that information to the BIAs, that would be great. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Councillor Thompson. No, I was just the c cameras it was really uh, for the police. Yeah, the cameras, the closed circuit cameras are very effective. Yeah. Yeah, that's great. Thank you. Um, any other uh, questions or comments to the motion? Okay, so let's call the vote. All those in favor? Okay, and that's approved. Uh, 8.2 Beck Road Bridge Tender and Award. Uh, we've got four recommendations. Motion by Councillor Peter Angel, second by Councillor Newesteg. And you want to speak to it, Councillor Newesteg? Um, yeah, this is for the Rankin um, yes. approval. Yep. I just want to comment that I watched them when they were doing the Usher Bridge, and it was amazing. They did exactly what they were supposed to do, finished on time, um, little disruption. It was and all the, uh, I live in that area, and all the um, neighbors at the time just couldn't, I couldn't believe that the great work that they did and that they were on time. So I fully support, just from experience, how well they um, they fulfilled their contract on the Usher Bridge project. Uh, yeah. I always feel good when, uh, when uh, they get a job. You know, it's going to be done right. They do good work. And it's interesting, he started his career here at the City of Niagara Falls, our municipal works department, right. Tom Rankin. Thank you for that. Yes, Councilor Coco. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I wanted to give kudos to staff in there. It talks about the uh, American water willow, and I also had conversations with Mr. Nickel about um, invasive Phragmites. So I'm really happy that the staff are um, looking at those things and putting plans in place to address them. Yeah, well for done. the invasive species, yeah. Okay, great. Any other comments? Okay, let's call the vote. All those in favor? Okay, and that's approved. Thank you for that. 8.3, let me just call it up here. Uh, exemption to plan of condominium, Thorold Stone Road. Okay, there's three recommendations moved by Councillor Pierangelo, seconded by Councillor Newestag. We'll call the vote. All those in favor? Okay, and that's approved. Thank you. 8.4 uh, draft plan of, uh, uh, yeah, extension of riverfront draft plan of subdivision, north side of Chippewa Parkway. So there are two recommendations that council grant an 18-month extension to the draft plan approval, and that council consider passing the resolution tonight. So looking for a direction from council. Moved by Councilor Strange, second by Councilor Newesteg. If there's no comments, we'll call the vote. All those in favor? Okay. Opposed. Oh, okay, and uh, opposed. Uh, it's approved, opposed by Councilor Lococo. All right, 8.5. I so move that. Um, move what? The Queen's former bank of Hamilton exactly. building. Okay, we got a motion by Councillor Thompson, second by Councillor Lococo. Did you want to speak to it, Councillor Lococo? Or? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I do sit on the Heritage Committee, and this was one of the um, um, more unique buildings in the city. It has a fi five sides and there's lots of other um, architectural features in there, but it's not designated at this point. So um, this, this report is um, going to send an intent to designate to the owner. Um, there's a history about it being one, one, the Bank of Hamilton. There's a physical um, uh, building structure. How many buildings have five sides and it's because of the railway going across it. Um, so um, I, I put the motion forward to to approve that. Okay. Uh, all right. Uh, Council uh, Councillor Strange. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I just want to know if if does the owner know that it's being redesignated at all? Because I think they it's very important because whatever they're doing with it, he or she, um, in the future, um, it could be very expensive, obviously, to keep up the facade of, of a heritage building. So I just want to make sure, does, does the owner know about this, that redesignation? Ms. Dolch? Thank you, Your Worship. Through you to the Councillor. Uh, there was a letter sent to the owner of the property uh, in uh, explaining about this evening's meeting and that we were bringing forward a report on an intent 
uh, to move forward with an intent to designate. They, it, should it be approved tonight, that intent to designate would go forward to them as well, again, to let them know that council approved an intent to designate um, before the proceed before does, we designate. Does he approve of, of this redesignation? So uh, through your worship to the councillor, uh, I just heard today that I don't know if he didn't didn't read the letter or or it was sent, but my understanding it was sent to the property owner on the address file. Um, I have heard I haven't received anything in writing myself, but I have heard that perhaps he's not supportive of that. So we will have to. Um, well, I, I just I, you know, we see with downtown, we, we you know, redevelopment, everything that's going on down there. I just think it's. It's premature unless the owner would want it re redesignated. We've seen what happened to a lot of the buildings that we've designated, and they've got torn down, right? Yeah. So we want to make sure that the owner is is wants to have this because what I don't know what his plans are. I'd like to hear from the owner um, on what he wants to plan on doing with this building in the future, and if he actually wants this redesignation. Okay, great. I'm going to come to you. I've got the clerk wants to weigh in. I'll come to Councillor Newstead. Uh, yes, I was copied on the letter from the owner today. Uh, I did forward it off to uh, the director of planning and to the planner, Mr. Brian Dick, who had written the report. Uh, I can just let you know that uh, the owner uh, did say that uh, he has recently heard uh, that it was being considered for her desi heritage designation. Uh, he did explain that he had not yet been contacted. I know that planning staff did follow the uh, the contact uh, list as to the owner was, so maybe he just didn't receive his mail. Uh, but as of right, as of today, uh, the owner has stated that they do not agree with the recommendation. Okay. Uh, okay, I've got Councillor Newstag and then uh, Peter Angel. Uh, through you, Mr. Mayor, to um, Ms. Tolch. What are their obligations to a property owner when something, when, a, when their building is designated a heritage site? Thank you, Your Worship, through you to the Councillor. So when you designate a heritage building, um, it depends on the attributes. So they may designate the entire exterior of the building. Sometimes they just uh, designate certain features of the building. In this case, uh, when you look at the report, it's really the exterior of the building, the five sides, as, as Councillor Lococo indicated. She did a great job explaining uh, like a summary of, of why the building is, is recommended for designation. Um, so those are the things. So generally what would happen is should the building be designated, they want to change um, something on the exterior, they would need to go to the Heritage Committee uh, to, to get that reviewed and approved prior to. So then by this person accepting it, they've got, uh, all of a sudden, um, limitations are imposed on them for what they can do. Not necessarily limitations, they just require approvals. Um, okay. Again, there is grant programs and other things that they can um, use at that point in time as well. To, and to can we them. just go ahead and designate a building without their approval or is there a process where they can, they have to, um, it's their building, they own it, they have to um, go along with it. So tonight's meeting is about an intent to designate. Um, it's, and again, as part of this, should council, I, and I'm just gonna explain, should council not approve uh, the recommendations in the report tonight uh, that we issue a notice of intention to designate? Um, so we have, again, we can't bring that back. Council can't include the property again on the designation list for another five years. So um, if it isn't passed, then we lose that opportunity to designate under the new legislation passed um, recently. So um, we only have two years to actually designate the property. So, but again, tonight, if, if it, the intent to designate isn't passed, we wouldn't be able to look at that again for another five years. Thank you. Okay. Councillor Peter Angel. Yeah, thanks, Your Worship. I just want to say that, um, I mean, I am in favor of designating buildings that have heritage significance. I'm also in favor of us not delisting our heritage buildings and tearing them down. Um, but I guess a third thing that I'm in favor of is, you know, honoring the wishes of someone who doesn't want their building designated. I, I think that was one of the first big votes when you got on council was Loretto. And, and I don't know if you remember, um, it was a very, very contentious issue and since then we've had other ones I mean the Carmelites came down you know a few years ago while well, we had the wrecking ball here tearing down the old uh, courthouse you know because uh, there was a recommendation being put forward that their building you know be designated heritage and they were saying we don't want this so I think it's important to um, you know to recognize heritage buildings but to only do so when the owners themselves want to you know maintain it as a heritage building 
Councillor Coco. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I, I think the point of tonight is to get the letter of intent out, and then maybe we can work with the owner and have conversations about what the designation actually means, what they can do, what they can't, what kind of permits. Because if we deny it tonight, as Ms. Dolch said, it would be five years before it could ever be. So if we approve just the intent letter going out, we can have further conversations with um, our staff and the owner and sort of see where, where we're going. But if we deny it, it's five years and it's not going to. Just on that point. Yeah. 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 yeah, just on that point, Your Worship, if that's the case, then um, I'll go along with not denying it, uh, but I would defer it instead. And I would defer it with the caveat that we need to hear from the owner uh, before we move forward with the letter of intent. So I'm, I, I'm happy to not deny it. Um, but I would like to defer it until I hear from the owner officially. Okay. Um, and was there anyone else who wanted to speak? Yes, Councillor Rococo. Um, I'm just trying to remember. Did was is there a motion on the? F yeah, yes, there is a motion on the floor. Did you second it? Yeah, yeah. I'm trying to remember. <laughs> Councillor Thompson uh, did put the motion, and I second it. So there is a motion on the floor. I guess the addition, um, if we defer it, does the letter go out then? I don't know if the letter's gone out yet. The le Mr. It's gone out already, has it? Well, been? a letter did, not the notice of intent. There's two different yeah. letters. Yeah. yeah. That is yeah. correct. Yeah. Just, a, just a letter went out um, explaining that we were coming tonight for an intention to designate <coughs> um, and that we would follow the process for intention to designate and the letter would go out for an intention to designate should it be approved tonight. Uh, should it be deferred tonight, obviously we can still have conversations with, with the owner. Uh, to talk about heritage designation and make sure they understand the process. Uh, I appreciate that perhaps it got lost in the mail or something happened uh, where they, they weren't informed and, and we want to definitely work with them, make sure they, they understand um, the programs we have to assist them and other things that, um, and any regulations they feel that, they, that may hinder them from designating. So we can have those discussions further if that's the will of council. I don't want this to be denied and then us have five years that we can't do anything. So if it would be more advantageous, I, if the mover would remove the motion and then we and could have discussions. Under his desk right. <laughs> and, and then we could have discussions and then bring it back. I just don't want it to get um, denied. Yeah, okay. Um, I'm just uh, waiting until uh, he's uh, finished. Yeah, no, no, I know. We just haven't done that. No, no, he's uh, he's okay. He's looking for something. What's that? Try to plug his phone in? Yeah. Okay. All right, good. So, Councillor Thompson, um, uh, so there's a suggestion right now, rather than approve, because it's not, it doesn't look like it's going to pass, we're, that we just defer it to give us time to make contact with the owner of the building. Well, they sent the letter out. No, they didn't send, they sent a letter, but not a letter of intent. That would only go out once council agrees. Okay. So are you okay with changing that, just yeah. in deferring it yeah. until yeah. we make contact? Sure. Okay. So sure. we got a motion by Councilor Thompson, second by Councilor Coco, that we agree to defer this and we, until staff have made contact with the owner to find out their uh, intentions. Is that fair? Okay, so we'll call the vote. All those in favor? Okay, and that's unanimous. Thank you for that. Yeah, yeah, like, yeah, whenever you make contact with them, yeah. But not by mail, you make a phone call, yeah. Okay, 8.6, uh, Niagara Falls Cultural Ambassadors. Um, we've got a couple of recommendations here. Um, one that the Culture Committee recommends that we establish an ambassador program that includes the town crier and poet laureate and the budgetary, and there be an increase, uh, looks like, per uh, appearance from $75 to $250. So it's a will of count. Councillor Strange? Yeah, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I, you know, I read this report and I'm just, I know the town crier, he's, he's always been out there and does a great job. And I don't mind if it's just four appearances because I think his salary was like a thousand a year or something yeah, anyways. Exactly. So if he's doing the four appearances, 250, that's no problem. Um, I just don't, See any logic with with the, uh, the with the poet? You know, we we have a lot of Wayne Wayne Campbell actually used to come and used to actually s say some poems before at council too. So I think if it's a if it's a passion by this person who wants to uh, to do a, a poem at council or wherever it is, they should be just doing it kind of as their passion, not being paid for. 
So I, 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 go, I agree with the town crier um, uh, with, with the thousand dollars a year. Um, I don't, is it, is, does he only do four appearances per year? Is that what the? Well, I don't know. We gotta maybe get clarity on that. So maybe we, we just say a thousand for the year and however appearances it is, it is, because it could be 10 appearances. So I would rather do a thousand for the year and then how many appearances it is. If it's 10, then he gets a hundred per appearance. I think it's a thousand for the year. I think we, we I think that's what the, uh, the budget was for the last uh, term, I believe, for the town choir. But as far as the a poet, I, I, I honestly don't agree with it because I, I would hate someone to say, okay, now we have to start paying for someone to sing the national anthem. You know what I mean? I think we, we have to draw the, draw the board somewhere, right? So. Mr. Mayor. Ms. Moldenhauer, can we find out what is what do we currently pay our uh, town crier? Is it a thousand a year? Through to the mayor, we uh, made a change to the budget this year where we were paying an appearance fee of seventy-five dollars. In the past, the honorarium was approximately fifteen hundred, and with the appearances, we have a um, fee for service agreement with the town crier where he does cry at um, our events and that's what we're paying him for so if he was invited elsewhere we're not paying for that it's just only if he's coming to our events and um, Canada Day Santa Claus Parade um, or for opening uh, park etc we may make the decision to invite him to that event so how many would he have done in a year how many events do we have an account, account? Three, three to four is what we would co uh, contract him for that's so it? So yeah. This is reducing yeah. For us. Like, I know he does other events, but that's what, with recreation and culture, what we asked him to attend. Because in the past, town crowds did a lot more than three or four. A lot more. I wonder what's changed. What's that? We don't use them. Mr. Mayor? Yes, Councillor. Are, are you done, Councillor Strange? Yeah. yeah, okay. Councillor Copeland? Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I do sit on the committee. Um, in in the report, it does say to a maximum of five, and it also says up to a thousand dollars. So they would get a thousand dollars for a maximum of five. They can't do any more to get more than that. Um, it did go from seventy-five dollars to two hundred and fifty dollars. Um, within the arts and culture community, there are minimums to pay musicians, uh, and $75 is very low. That's why it went to the 250 and it's not for the appearance of the day that they come, whether it's an hour or two, two hours there. It's all the preparation that they do ahead of time. We have a culture committee that um, has nine people, Ms. Moldenhauer? Nine people, and they want to improve and um, enhance the lives of our community and this was their recommendation so nine people came up with this because it's important to culture it's only a thousand dollars i'm afraid if you go back to the culture committee and say no we don't want a poet laureate there was a lot of discussion we used to have a, um, a historian as well and with sherman zavitz when he retired there was no one to replace him no one put their their name forward and there's a lot of other ways for us to uh, share our history so um, i will move this this recommendation for the poet laureate of Seth thousand dollars maximum of five and with the um, town crier thousand uh, dollars maximum of five okay um, the clarification from our CAO yeah the report has two recommendations on it so the second recommendation is to move it to the budget committee uh, so I, <clears throat> if council wants to pre-approve the budget then they should be clear with that because then that would essentially um, place that budget into effect uh, for the 2024 budget now based upon that decision. The second recommendation is uh, what we're trying to do with all our funding decisions is to move it to the budget. Uh, so that way council has not made a bunch of decisions without knowing all the other choices that they may or may not have. Uh, so I just want to be careful with that, uh, that council understands the second motion there and they're not changing that because you could approve these two positions but you may get to the budget and say listen I really only have X number of dollars so therefore that reduces the amount of appearances or reduces something else uh, or you know what we have more money and I'm willing to invest more into that and you're not capping it so I just want to make sure that if if council's intent is to change that and harden the budget then that's fine but that's not what the staff recommendation is we want to push it all to the budget like we do most other spending decisions. 
My motion was to accept the recommendation, so that included the budget, but to have both of them in there, the town crier and the poet laureate. Move to the budget. Yes. Hey, do we have a seconder for that? Is there a seconder? Sure. Okay, seconded by Councillor Thompson. Okay, so we have any discussion to the motion? Okay, all right then. So we'll call the vote. All those in favor? Opposed? Okay, so that motion fails. So what's the motion? Yes, Councillor Strange. I'd like to make a motion that we, we go with the town crier with, with the, uh, the amount of money that's stated here. Okay. Yep. Okay. Do you have a seconder? Is there a seconder to that motion? Okay, Councillor Strange, uh, Peter Angelo. Yes, Councillor Coke. Is that going to the budget process as well? I guess uh, it that, would that's be, my right? question. Yeah. Is that was that the intention? Yeah, right. Okay. Any discussion to the motion? Okay. We'll call the vote. All those in favor? Okay. And that's approved. Okay. Thank you for that. Eight point seven. This is the uh, financial statements. Motion by Councillor Peter Angelo, seconded by Councillor Baldinelli that we approve the statements. All those in favor? Okay, and that's approved. 8.8. Motion by Councillor Peter Angelo, second by Councillor Strange that we move the final report. Uh, Councillor Lococo. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I do have some uh, a question, I guess, for Mitch, Ms. Dolch. We've been talking about the cost of Bill 23, and uh, this report gives us a million dollars back for the money that we've spent on the different programs to streamline and expedite. That's great. Um, the, the region has uh, estimated that the impact over uh, 10 years is $74.8 million. AMO, the Association of Municipalities, says $5 billion in 10 years to taxpayers. Waterloo says $530 million. Toronto, $2 billion over 10 years. Mississauga, $885 million. Peel, $2 billion. Niagara-on-the-Lake says $1.3 billion over five years. I guess my question is, um, do we know um, any more information than when I asked the last time about the cost and now we've, we're, we're receiving a million dollars off of that. Are we any closer to figuring out the price tag on Bill 23 and what it's doing to the city? Who's going to answer that? Ms. Dolch? Thank you, Your Worship, through you to the Councillor. So in terms of the streamlined funding, obviously it was dedicated for the three things we have identified in the report, not necessarily to do with Bill 23, development charges, other things, CBC, all those things. Um, in terms of the impact, while I appreciate other municipalities might have come up with a figure, uh, again, I struggle with trying to come up with a figure. I know uh, you've heard from uh, Hampson, to our, uh, our consultants, Watson, tonight on, on the fact that the province has just come out with are coming out with definitions on affordable and attainable. Those are things that we, we can use to kind of give you some guidance on, on you know, what those impacts would be. Otherwise, it's really just a best guess based on a guess on what the province would consider affordable, attainable uh, for those development credits. Um, you know, again, we can ballpark some things, but, but again, until we know some definitions, it's really tough. Um, you know, I can throw out a big number, but I, I, I hate to do that. I'd rather be accurate and, and consistent if we're going to do it, and I'll pass it to our CEO. Yeah, it, the amount of estimates, even when you look at the numbers that you quoted, Councillor, uh, you know, if you compare what Niagara and Lake is saying to Waterloo is saying, and there's two massively different sized communities, and their numbers are, are both super large, I, you know, the uh, number of assumptions you have to make with regards to growth rate, with regards to what... Um, deductions that you may already have like this council had already moved aggressively towards uh, providing deductions for affordable housing where other councils didn't so they would have a more of a loss than we would um, and um, you know and the other thing we have the advantage our DC bylaws coming up so you know and our DCs were historically lower so we actually have the ability to come up with more DCs to make up for some of that gap where a lot of Toronto communities were charging massive amounts for DCs, uh, quite frankly, not, you know, and that was causing some affordability issues. So yes, they have a big, bigger impact. So the challenge we have with this trying to do an estimate is there are so many assumptions you have to put into it, it becomes, um, you know, it becomes difficult to say, well, here's the number because there's so many variables to it. Well, 
you know, what we are going to do is we're going to come up with a new DC study, which is where most of the impact would be. And then you'll see what the forecast is, especially when we get the definition of affordable, because that's going to make a large impact to what is our DC uh, loss. Um, the graduation of the increase um, is one of the bigger quote unquote losses that we have, but because we're starting with a fresh bylaw, we don't have as big of an impact on that. The other big one that we have is the loss of studies being um, put into the DCs, which would be several hundred thousand dollars. Um, and that's gonna hit the levy versus, uh, uh, versus the DC. So, you know, it, it's a lot of work for our staff to come up with a number which anybody else would poke holes into. And I've seen some of those numbers come up, you know, quietly I would say, not sure how they came up with the number. So I think what our finance committee wants to do is come up with our DC plan with our new study and tell you here's what the impacts are. And I think with that, once we have our plan, you could say, well, if we had the old rules, what would it be? And then at least then we're dealing apples to apples at that point in time. Thank you. I appreciate all of that. If you're ever talking to any other municipalities, ask them what the formula is, because I'd like to understand how they're coming up with these numbers. But I appreciate all of yeah. the information that goes into it. I, I have, and you know, I well, some of them I ask, what was your assumed growth rate in your in your loss versus your actual growth rate in your you know, and oh, those numbers don't match up. The region has a bigger issue because of uh, because of the social housing issue, which isn't part of our DC uh, bylaw. So the region has a different challenge on their hands, uh, which is a bit more specific. The other interesting thing is the province is starting their audits now on the losses, uh, and they're having their hearings now. So it'll be also interesting to see, and I think they've appointed it was either KPMG or PwC to do uh, the independent review, and I think that will be probably the most uh, uh, definitive analysis of it because they have a third party uh, looking into those into those numbers. Great, thank you very much. All right, so did we call the vote yet? Okay, so we'll call the vote on that. All those in favor? Okay, that's approved. Thank you. Now we're on to communications. Uh, there's a recommendation. Okay, okay, recommendation that we approve and moved by. Councilor Peter Angelo, seconded by Councilor Neustag, um, 9.1 through 9.3. Okay, we'll call the vote. All those in favor? Okay, and that's approved. Thank you for that. So, just real quickly, it's a proclamation uh, flag raising for activism against gender based violence on November 25th uh, for 16 days. Then there's the um, uh, memo for. Uh, so, and, uh, and and a couple of memos. Item 10, communications and comments to the city so clerk. May, yeah. uh, yes, did you have specific ones, Councilor Lococo? Yes, Mr. Mayor, I'd like to pull 10.2 and 10.5, please. Okay. okay, so why don't we just deal with 10.2? Why don't we deal with them first, then we'll do them as a block. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. What is this talking about? <laughs> I've read it over and over again, and it's talking about illegal land use enforcement and trucks. I, I just didn't understand what it was. I don't was. know. I was just intending just to receive and file it. When we okay, get I just thought it was important to somebody, and maybe it would it be probably important is. to us, but I didn't know what it was. Does anybody know? Does anybody know? Town of Coburg. 10.2. Illegal Coburg. land use enforcement. A town of Coburg. About trucking land, and I, I just didn't understand it. <coughs> It's not that important. We don't have to. I just thought maybe I wasn't catching on. <laughs> the problem is you don't get the backstory, right? And and that doesn't seem to cover what happened to lead to this resolution. So okay. And then ten point five. Yes. Thank you. Um. Uh, through the mayor to the clerk. I was wondering if the clerk knows how much this report cost. Mr. Clerk. Yes, we have received an invoice. Uh, I don't have the exact figure in front of me, but it is in the neighborhood of ten thousand eight hundred dollars. Wow. Okay, thank you. And um, al although I was um, happy about the ruling, I was surprised that there was not more information, but that is the decision of the Integrity Commissioner. Thank you. Okay, thank you for that. So, um, Do you want a motion to receive and file all five? Yes. So, motion by, motion by Councillor, Councillor Peter Angelo, second by Councillor Strange, that we receive and file 10.1 through 10.5. Um, 
and if there's no further ones to be pulled, we'll call the vote. All those in favor? Okay, and that's approved. And the, uh, yes, please. Okay, motion by Councillor Peter Angelo that we approve the two resolutions that we have. Uh, are you I'm, seconding? I'm opposed to 11.2 because okay. that's a bylaw from earlier. Okay, so I need a seconder for the two resolutions. Uh, Councillor Neustag uh, will call the vote. All those in favor? Okay, um, with the um, opposition of Councillor DeCoco for 11.2, right? Okay, Mr. Clerk, ratification of in camera. Uh, yes, Your Worship, Council met uh, earlier this afternoon on a couple of matters uh, in camera. Uh, only one needing ratification, and that is that Council authorized the Mayor and Clerk to act on behalf of the City to execute uh, the retail lease for the Niagara Falls Exchange Cafe with Ma Te Restaurants Inc. for a term of two years and uh, an option to renew for one additional term. One year term. Okay, for a motion to ratify in camera. So Moved by Councillor Patel, seconded by Councillor Baldinelli. All those in favor? Okay, and that's approved. Um, are there any notices of motion? Councillor Lococo? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. At the next meeting, I will be bringing a motion to declare intimate partner violence as an epidemic and declaration of intimate, in, intimate partner violence as an, an epi epidemic. Uh, Birchway will be here to speak. And I don't know if you saw yesterday's news, five people um, were were killed because of domestic uh, partner violence. So I'd like to bring that to the next meeting. Yeah, yeah we've already passed that at the region yeah. uh, recently. Yeah. Um, okay, so thank you for that. Well, you could wave the, uh, you can wave the. Uh, it's a long one. If you're fine with it, it was the same one. That Is the it the exact same one that the region just passed? It's the exact same one, except that the region says um, the city of Niagara Falls, and it takes out regional council at the meeting held on September 21st. It's the exact same thing. Okay, so what? But I know Birchway wanted to speak on it, Pardon and me? they're not here. I'm sorry? Birchway wanted to speak oh, on it. Yeah. Oh, Birchway. Yeah. What's that? Okay, if you'd like to approve yeah, it. Yeah, they're good. And so if you want to... Make the okay. motion to waive the procedural motion. bylaw sure. Thank you. and approve the um, motion, and second that'll be seconded by Councillor Peter Angelo. And now is there a discussion to the to the it's a, to the motion to the resolution? Is it it's a resolution? Is it's it? a resolution, and it's the same one that the yep. the region region posted. Yep, that we just approved last week. Uh, is there any discussion? Did you want to speak to it, Councillor Coco? No, I, I think we all know um, the yep. issues that are there, and um, there's 86 recommendations that can be brought forward. Okay, that's great. So mm -hmm. let's call the vote. All those in favor? Okay, that's unanimous. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, new business? Yeah. Okay. Yep, Mr. Uh, Councillor Peter. Thanks, Your Worship. Um, I have two items in new business. I already talked to the CAO. Uh, about them, so they could just be direction to staff, but I'll quickly try to explain both of them uh, to council. Um, the one issue has to do with cannabis, and, and I've been asked to keep the location uh, private, Your Worship. Um, it's the same issue that I brought up in April here. Uh, you know, there was, there was a property who was growing 200 plants outdoors, and I was contacted by the neighbor uh, to see whether or not our bylaws allowed it. Um, long story short, Your Worship, I, I did have a meeting with staff uh, in the summertime. Um, bylaw said that it was allowed. Uh, the police shut it down. They, they tore the operation down and they're pressing charges. My point is, uh, you know, how can there be such a disconnect between our bylaws and, and and what the police deem as legal. Um, so uh, the other part about it that, that I didn't find fair was that the property owner where the 200 plants were growing and the person that was growing the 200 plants, neither one of them lived in Niagara Falls. Um, so it was only the neighbors that had to deal with it. Uh, and it took a long time to get it shut down. So, you know, my comments to the CAO were, can we look at our bylaws and see what is allowed? Because if bylaws, you know, 
it's going to take the opinion that this is allowed, but the police are going to take the opinion that no, no, this is not allowed. It's illegal. Um, then we need to rework something here. Um, and I don't really think it's right anyway for, for anyone to have to live beside 200 outdoor planes. Um, I don't want to infringe on anyone's rights uh, because I understand that you know people do get prescriptions to grow plants, um, but then there's the rights of the neighbors as well, your worship, the people that live around them. So um, I don't know if it's direction to staff or uh, if the CAO wants to comment about where it would possibly head from here. Maybe. Yeah, staff will take it away as direction. It's always been an issue for enforcement because sometimes uh, federal rules and provincial rules trump municipal rules. Uh, but if we can work closely with the police, I know we had a great working relationship when I was in Norfolk with the OPP and their green unit, as they called it, which was uh, specifically designed uh, for enforcement. Uh, sometimes the police are enforcing on other rules uh, that we can't enforce on. Uh, but we'll take it away because I think the intent of this council was uh, they wanted to restrict growing uh, to non-residential areas, to industrial areas, and if there was some loopholes in the bylaw, we'll we'll take a look to see if you know if we can patch that up and move forward and see what else we can do to work with the NRP on that. Okay. Well, the neighbors, thank you. Uh, the other issue, you worship, uh, and I know I think other members of council were probably contacted. It's in regards to the fire hall theater and their parking. Um, so they have a certain amount of vents per year. Uh, traditionally, they've received a stack of passes for their volunteers. Their volunteers put the pass on the front windshield, uh, and when the event happens, they're able to park on the street. They've been told uh, by staff this year that they need to park at the, uh, at the <coughs> municipal parking lot that's at the corner of Kitchener and Victoria. It's a little bit of ways. Um, you know, I, like I think one of the strongest points that they have is, first of all, it's a city-owned facility and we don't really have a lot of parking. Whereas if you compare that to a lot of other municipally owned buildings, whether it's the Gale Center or the McBain or even you know, the new exchange that we're building, we have a lot of parking there for volunteers. So um, I'd like to see a resolution in terms of you know, parking for the volunteers so that they don't have to go down to the municipal parking lot and pay. Um, so again, it's something that I discussed with the CAO and. I don't know whether or not he wants to give an update of where he would take it with staff, but I know that there is a meeting uh, later on this week, so I, I hope something comes of that. Uh, did, did you want to weigh in, Mr. CEO? Because no, I also had. Okay, and and I, I did want to comment because I did this did come across my desk as well, and yep. I said the same thing. I said I yep. absolutely disagree with what we're doing, right. and if they're gonna have to park in the kitchen a lot, they should be doing it for free. For free, right now. Absolutely for free, yeah. and it, and and that's like I don't understand why we wouldn't. We're trying to support our own facility and our own volunteers. So yeah. I agree. So Yeah, another one of the points that they had, Your Worship, is that it's hard enough to get volunteers um, to expect them to go down to uh, um, one of their events and then have to go to the parking lot of Kitchener and pay 15 bucks just to park there, you know, yeah. only to walk back to the Fire Hall Theater. I, I think we can do it a better way. Like, we have on-street parking there. We can provide it to the volunteers. And that's the direction that I'd like to see us going. I agree. I okay. agree. So let's let them. We can have, let them do their meeting, and then if not, then you know, might be direction from council. Okay. So, um, uh, Councillor Lacoco. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Regarding the fire hall theater, I was there on Friday night, and I had the same email and discussion. So with my parking pass, I went and parked on on the the street, and there's about 13 or 14 behind the um, the theater, and most of the people that were there Friday night were elderly and um, needed some assistance walking and that sort of thing. So we we definitely need to do something better than what what we are doing now. The the parking pass um, they they were given a, a pad of paper and, and passed them out. That worked. Um, but yeah, I felt bad taking a parking space and people are walking halfway down the block and, and the volunteers ended up paying for parking as well. They weren't happy. Yeah, okay, that's good. So that that's was good. one of my things. I'm sure staff are listening. Was there any other comments to this point here, uh, just before we move on? Okay. Councillor Peter Angelo, do you have another point of... Uh... No, that was the two. You sure? That was the two that I have. Okay. Uh, I'm okay. <laughs> Poor Fredder. I don't think Ms. Dolch has paid attention and you guys are yelling on donuts. Councilor Coco. Okay, I had two more things. Uh, a resident contacted me about the tax and water rebate. I've been in uh, contact with Ms. Clark regarding this. So on the application, it says Ontario Disability Support Program, so ODSP, 
but it will not accept the federal CPP disability. So if you're on one disability program, you get the rebate. If you're on another disability program, you don't get the rebate. So we've had some discussions of, um, about what it is, and I just wanted uh, for staff when they're reviewing the amounts, because there's a motion to review the amounts for next year, when they're doing that to look at um, the CPP federal disability as well, that if somebody was on either one of those, that they could apply for it. Okay, good. Is that uh, just direction of the staff? Or Tune in. Yeah. Okay, great. Okay. Thank you. And the, the last one, um, I know the new housing minister is looking at um, some of the MZOs, and I was wondering if any of the MZOs that they're looking at will be from Niagara Falls. I know we had two MZOs. Are, are they looking at those, or I do haven't, we know? Uh, I spoke with the minister when he was here a couple of weeks ago, and I'd be surprised if they did because ours went through the proper planning process. So I'd be very, and through, you know, rigorous, um, you know, review, so I'd be surprised, but I mean, at this point, the, the province has been doing a lot of things, so I don't know, but we haven't, and I, maybe I'd ask uh, um, Ms. Dolch if she's got any kind of uh, insight or feedback. Thank you, Worship. No, I haven't heard anything either on the MZOs on our front, but um, I would agree with the, the mayor in terms of planning staff did support the MZOs. We brought them forward to council and we followed appropriate process. Okay, great. I just didn't know what they were looking for yeah. and um, I just wondered. Thank you, that's all. Okay, thank you for that. Any other new business? Not new business, I just want to say something. You say something, you'd say, is it about the spooky awards? <laughs> about donuts? No? Okay, what did you want to talk about? <laughs> Oh, you're dancing. Yes. Yes. We've got to hear about uh, Councillor Patel's dancing yes. uh, expose. Yeah. And how much she raised the record, the most raised. Yep. So as uh, most of the people know, last week I participated in uh, Easter Seals Dancing with the Stars. And I raised almost $13,000. Wow. Oh, yeah. 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 And I want to thank everybody in the council chambers who actually supported my cause. My partner was uh, Tammy Lacas. She's the owner of the dance, uh, dancing feet on the Queen Street, and she was amazing. She actually taught me how to dance. And why don't you, know, you show us? We've got a little bit of open <laughs> area here. We could. So our dance was big. <laughs> we we were doing two dances. So I said I want to do something from my background. So I did the Bollywood dance, and. Her background is indigenous background, so we did indigenous dance. They was pretty good, actually. We both showcased our background, and she was excellent. <laughs> Ruben was there, she and it was so much fun. Career. Thank what was you. That? She has another career. Oh. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so it was so much. It was actually really fun. Uh, we only trained for like, about four weeks, but Tammy was amazing. So I want to thank Tam Tammy for taking time to teach me and bearing with me for those four weeks because, as you know, I'm always not on time. <laughs> no. <laughs> but she was amazing, and we actually uh, met lots of Easter Seals ambassador, and it was a great evening. Overall, the event raised um, about $90,000. Uh, $90, wow. And it was a great energy in the room. It was such a positive energy. Everybody was feeling the love in the air. And there were around 320 guests. And I'm still surprised I danced in front of 320 people. <laughs> but yeah, I did it. And I want to thank everybody who came out to support and everybody who supported my cause. That's what I want to say. And I want to thank Tammy for it, too. You should have sent us in some pictures we could have put up here. And I would ask council, when you go to events on behalf of council, send us the pictures so yep. we can include them. So the big question is, who's going to be next year? No, the big question oh, was. Laurie's. Oh, Laurie's. Yes. <laughs> Excellent. Oh, bravo. Excellent. Congratulations. I make the motion. <laughs> What, what I wanted to say was on Friday, Tammy is closing her business there after 15 years on Queen Street. So I wanted to thank her and all, all of the families that she has uh, impacted in Niagara Falls. She's done a great job. I'm That's sorry great. to see her go. Yeah. yeah. Were they still talking about Councillor Strange's uh, dancing from last year? His yeah, tight they, pants? They uh, asked me if I could borrow his pants. <laughs> 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 so yes, I want to wish uh, Tammy all the best for her future uh, adventure because she she's going to do something different. So I just want to wish her all the best. And as, uh, someone else I want to recognize was the uh, school crossing guards. But last week it was very damp and very cold, and I was driving my daughter to school every morning. And you see these crossing guards; they are not all young, but they're still standing in the rain and they're giving kids high five, and they always show up there for their work on time. So I just want to recognize how great service they are doing. I just want to thank them. Yeah, that's great. Uh, yeah. You're here. You're, they do a great job in all weather, right? That's mm -hmm. great. That's great. 
If there's no other new business, or no spooky words, Mike, did you not want to say anything else about, oh yeah, before I go to the bylaws, uh, thank you for reminding me, spooky words, you talked about it last time, this is our last chance to talk about it. Uh, I don't have anything in front of me, but I think, <laughs> so the spooky we have one week until they decide who yeah. wins the, the spooky awards, so yeah. I just want to wish everyone good luck. I don't, I'm sure we'll get something back to council after and, and find out who wins, because I think uh, uh, Nathan from the Emergency Advisory Committee, you know, couple of people from each city committee are judging yeah so we'll be able to uh, to get a fair amount so encourage the, everyone to enter their houses right on the website this yes to the website please encourage everyone to uh, to dress up your your house and it's a good way especially during COVID it was, it's such a great idea by former councillor uh, Chris Dabrowski it's really great to get the, the kids and families involved especially during that time but it's great that we're continuing as, as well as well as the Sparkle Awards, I guess, too. Oh, yeah, that's coming, That'll too. That'll be coming, too. That's coming. <laughs> okay, so I need a motion to introduce the bylaws. First, second, third. Motion by Councillor Peter Angelo, second by Councillor Newestead. Give the bylaws a first, second, and third reading. All those in favor? That's approved. Motion for adjournment? Ah, oh, Councillor Patel and second by Councillor Thompson. All those in favor? All right, thank you, everybody. We made it.